question for the today's tutorial. So the first part is we will talk about the future of education in the 21st century. So AI has changed almost everything in our life and uh, it's, 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 it's changing the part of the education. So we will see what, what have been done in the past and what is going to be done in the future. Second part is AI in K-12 education. So here we will focus on a, a few bunch of very cool and recent AI applications in K-12 education. And the third part is about uh, multimodal learning in education. So this, so in the third part, we will split into two, um, two parts. The first part is we will go over some uh, hardcore machine learning techniques on educational representation learning. And the second part, we will go over how do we use the, the general data science and the machine learning to do the algorithm assessment and evaluations. And the last part is the conclusion and the future, <coughs> the future work. Okay, so the first part, uh, the first part, uh, uh, the tutorial instructor of the first part will be Professor Rose Lacking. So Rose is a professor of learner centered design in UCL. And Rose is uh, quite famous in the education domain. And she is one, she's one of the 20 most influential people in education. And also she's the co-founder of the Institute of Ethical AI in Education, the director of Educate London. And also Rose is the president of the AIED. Okay, and uh, I, I will talk about I uh, I will talk about the the second part and the half of the third part. So I'm Zhao Liu, a Frontier Education Group, and uh, I uh, uh, together with my team we create the TL op AI Open Platform, so everyone can access and use the AI technology we built for education. And uh, the the third instructor is new. So Neil is a professor of computer science at WPI, and Neil is also the director of the Learning Science and Technology Technologies Graduate Program. And Neil have his famous assessment, uh, uh, the the website of the tools, and he will talk about about that uh, later in the part three. Okay, so the first part is I, I will I will I will handle. I will handle the presentation. I will pass the presentation to Rose, and she will talk about the, the first part, the future of education for the 21st century. Uh, and by the way, this is Neil. Uh, and just and someone actually just actually said, actually, will this be recorded? Z Tower, are you going to record it? Yeah. Yeah. It, Excellent. It good. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, and uh, it's good that we record it after we actually get Rose's email not to show up. Yes. <laughs> Take it away, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Neil. Um, and thanks, everybody. Yes, I'm going to do a lot of context setting, really, to think about, because you know, many data mining machine learning techniques can be very important for education, but what is the future of education in the 21st century? And I think in order to appreciate the future, you need to just have a little look at the past. So I am going to talk about AI in very general terms, thinking of it as technology that's capable of actions and behaviours that require intelligence if done by humans. Um, so very, very general de de definition. There are many, many more detailed definitions. And of course, we can already see many, many applications of AI in education, whether it's bots in university life or whether it's children in primary schools being taught about robots being taught about AI. But where did it all start? And I think it's really important to look at where it all started to think clearly about the future. And I looked because I, a lot of people associate the word AI with the word robot, I had to look to see where I could find the earliest use of the word robot. And the earliest use I could find was in a play by a Czech playwright called Karol Kapec. And he had a dystopian future play with these people dressed up as robots. I think everybody on that screen looks a bit robotic. Um, but the point of, of showing this is, is to remind us that uh, at the moment, uh, we very much look at developing AI systems that can look and behave like humans. But in the early days of thinking about robots, it was very much about people um, pretending to be robots because we didn't have any real robots. 
And I think we need to be careful in education that we don't end up in a situation where we are encouraging people to behave like robots. And I'll say more about that um, a little further on. So it all really started, modern AI that is, um, in 1956 in September, so next month, 1956, so that'll be 64 years ago there, um, in a meeting in Dartmouth College in New Hampshire in the USA, and 10 scientists gathered together um, for a couple of months over the summer and believed that it would be possible to describe every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence in a way that was so precise that a machine could be built to simulate it. And I think that sounds crazy now, but that was very much what people thought could happen. And I would say that's because we vastly underestimated how enormously complex human intelligence is. Another couple of key characters, I think, you know, from a robotics point of view, it's Norma Viner, the, the forefather of, or father of cybernetics, and Alan Turing, the famous mathematicians, who really introduced the idea of the Turing test, which was the test of whether a an AI system could fool humans into believing that it was a human. And people still take part in Turing tests today. And when I interact with bots on a website or any other kind of application on my phone, I'm always reminded of one of the very early AI systems called ELISA, which was a text-based interface, which is the kind of thing that was being used in the 60s. And ELISA pretended to be a psychotherapist and you could ask ELISA questions and ELISA would try to come back with a, a text answer that was appropriate. But these systems were based on a set of rules, not on machine learning. And so the system fell over very quickly. And you can see at the end of this little example that uh, the human says, because he's spotted that really this conversation is not going anywhere uh, and says, you know, now you're just talking nonsense. And the ELISA system comes back with what makes you believe now I am just talking nonsense. And that's because of this pattern matching. ELISA has looked for a rule uh, that she can match to uh, the kind of statement that's been made, which is, but you're just talking nonsense. So these were very brittle systems, but actually a lot of people were fooled by them. And I find many of the bots one interacts with today not that much more intelligent, to be frank. And these rule-based systems were actually quite effective. They led to a whole range of expert systems in the 80s that uh, were responsible for some very useful systems, um, looking at medical diagnosis, for example. And one of those systems, Mycin, uh, was also very influential in my mind for helping us understand about how we need to make AI explainable. And certainly this was an approach that was used in education, one of the very early systems, and you can see that publication dated 1978, which was a diagnostic model to try and understand very basic procedural skills, ideas errors. The target domain, we don't have any label data. So the idea is actually we try to make the target Now I hear somebody else speaking. Yeah, uh, uh, let, 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 let me Mm, let me mute them. Okay. Okay, that's lovely. Um, and so this was an example where we were trying to diagnose the errors that uh, young children make when they're learning um, basic arithmetic skills by building a model that not only had the correct rules but also some buggy rules so that we could provide better support. So a lot of these systems were built in the early days on this rule-based approach. And actually the, the, the screen here is a, a system that's been developed into something extremely successful, but started off being based on very much a rule type of AI. And those early systems that were used in education were really a form of intelligent tutoring system where you had a, a model, a knowledge representation uh, of a particular domain, maths in this example, you had a model of the learner, i.e. how much you believed that that learner understood about maths, a pedagogical model and a model about how you should apply the rules, how teaching should be done, an interface, and the student interacted with that interface. And we've come a long way since this time, but nevertheless, there's still many systems that use, even if only in part, use rules to create some useful personalization or adaptation. But 
some famous game-changing moments. I remember when I was studying for my PhD, this, this particular point in the game when the IBM system Deep Blue demonstrated its prowess at chess by beating the then chess grandmaster, Gary Kasparov. And I remember, you know, I was working in, a, in an AI department at the time and people were very excited about this because people thought, well, chess is played by intelligent people. Hey, if we can build a machine that can play chess to this level, then we must be able to do some great things with AI. And this was all based on this rule approach. But actually, it wasn't long before people realized that actually things like being able to see vision is much harder. Um, than playing chess and we then realized that we weren't actually close to creating a really generally intelligent machine and then of course the, the moment that you'll all know about when AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol and of course this was deep learning and machine learning so we know that we can build systems that can not only play games to a very high level systems that can learn and improve and improve and improve. And of course, it's not just in game playing. Um, it's also in many, many useful areas such as um, autonomous vehicles and medical diagnosis, lots and lots of very useful systems being developed. And I think there's four things that it's important to remember. The autonomy of the AI system, because it's able to perform tasks in complex environments without constantly having to go back to a human and adaptivity, uh, the ability to improve performance by learning from experience, which of course is how humans learn. But the way machine learning happens is not precisely the same as human learning. But that adaptivity can be really useful when we're building AI systems to help people learn. And we need to, of course, differentiate between narrow AI, AI that can do one thing, which is where we are now, and artificial general intelligence, where we have this dream of a machine that can do all of the things that we as humans can do. So whilst at the moment we're at the stage of having a machine that can play chess or drive a car or diagnose an illness or be able to recognize images of specific things, and yet the consultant in a hospital who can conduct the medical diagnosis can probably also play chess, also drive a car, also recognizes images. And, and we don't have AI that has that general kind of intelligence yet. And personally, I, I'm not a big fan of believing that AGI is really possible. But my real reason for that is that I believe that there's a huge difference between human intelligence and artificial intelligence. And we really need to start recognizing that difference. And that's what the future of education with respect to AI really needs to focus on. So if I think about intelligence, human intelligence. I see it as a very complex, intertwined concept that is made up of these different elements. These are not separate intelligences, they are different elements of a very complex whole. And we have interdisciplinary academic intelligence that's extremely important as we need different disciplines to be able to talk to each other. So if I'm an ex expert in physics, it's really useful if I can talk to experts in medicine, and that's how nuclear medicine you know, has come about and become such a force in diagnostics and treatment. And meta-knowing intelligence, and, and this is very much about understanding what knowledge is, what it comes from, why should we believe something is true? And so it's about understanding data and evidence, evidence that should persuade us either to believe something or not to believe something and social intelligence that we as humans can be very good at and is increasingly important because the complex problems that we face today can rarely be solved by one individual. We need people to be capable of complex collaborative problem solving. And then a set of intelligences that going along with meta-knowing are really about meta-intelligence, about self-understanding. So metacognitive intelligence is about being able to understand, regulate, control aspects of our thinking. So self-regulation in learning is extremely important and is a good example of this. Metasubjective intelligence, which is about not just being emotionally intelligent, but being able to understand accurately how our emotional intelligence is developing, how the emotional intelligence of the people we're working with is or is not developing. 
So it's being able to stand back and, and really understand and to an extent try and control that development. Metacontextual intelligence, something I think we underestimate at our cost and we underestimate a lot of the time. It's relatively simple for, for us to move between different environments, physical and digital, virtual environments. It's easy for us to, to move into interacting with different people, with different kinds of resources. And we can do it often without really being aware of the change that's happening. It's just part of the way that we are. But it's incredibly difficult for AI systems to do that. And I think it's part of our intelligence we don't pay enough attention to. And then the kind of gold when it comes to learning this idea of perceived self-efficacy and in particular accurate perceived self-efficacy where we as humans are capable of setting our own goals of making good judgments about how likely we are to be able to achieve that goal what we need to do in order to achieve that goal what we need to learn what we need to understand what other resources we need to pull together and that might be people we need to work with it might be technologies we can do this but we need to develop all of these elements of our intelligence to a sophisticated level in order to get to that point. Now, currently, AI really has only made considerable advances in the areas of interdisciplinary academic intelligence, meta-knowing to an extent, social intelligence. Some would argue that AI can be emotionally intelligent. I would disagree and say that we can um, simulate that there is no real empathy, there is no real understanding of emotions and feeling those emotions. So really, we need to think about our education systems focusing on the parts of our intelligence we can't automate rather than the parts that we can. So we end up in a world where the AI and the human eye work together in a complementary way. But at the stage we are at the moment with respect to AI and education, we nevertheless had some very smart tools available to us. And I know Neil is going to talk later today about an extremely good system called assistments. But I'll give you just a few examples of the kind of current state of the art out there being used actively in classrooms at the moment. This is a system called N-Skills, um, developed by a company in the US called Alello. And it's a conversational agent with whom you can hold a conversation as you learn to speak and understand English. And so wherever you are in the world, you can open up a browser and as long as you've got an internet connection, you can have a conversation with this system and it will interpret what you're saying and respond in an appropriate way, individualized to what you need as a learner of English. And there are many systems, examples from Carnegie Learning and from Century Tech in the UK, where we have really good quality adaptive systems that can take an area of the curriculum and provide support and activities that are very tailored to the needs of an individual learner and that can be extremely useful and well designed systems like this can perform as well as a teacher a human teacher when that human teacher is interacting with a class of students we can't yet build systems that can tutor as effectively as a human tutor working on a one-to-one -one basis but hardly any learners ever have access to that so these systems can nevertheless be very useful and then there's a whole range of other AI systems used in education that are versions of recommender systems that are really recommending resources to you as you are the learner or indeed recommending resources to you if you are the teacher that are good for your students to use as they're learning about a particular subject that's the focus of their attention at the moment. So these systems don't tutor or teach, they provide resources. Although Volley is a slight exception to that um, within the training world, Volley doesn't just find resources, it collates those resources into activities, but it's still not a tutoring system. And just in case you were thinking that AI for education is only for adults or for school age learners or students at university or college, no, absolutely, it can start very young. This is an example of an AI system that's developed for use with very young infants who are learning to talk. 
So it's designed to help with their language skills and the little cloud shape um, monitor sits in the, in the infant's room and monitors any um, verbal interactions or, or, or any audio between the infant and others, sisters, brothers, parents, and then sends information back to the parents to give them guidance and advice about how to help their young infant develop their language skills. And as far as I know, this is only available for English at the moment. And lastly, it's not just about using AI to focus on particular areas of the curriculum. We can also have systems that can help us develop what you might call cognitive fitness. So this is an example of a system called My Cognition that helps to develop your general executive function, your ability to pay attention, your memory, both short term and long term. And it uses a little bit of AI to adapt the way that the system interacts with you to try and meet your individual needs. And the system does an initial diagnostic test and then you play a game called Aquasnap. And as you play this game, the system adapts to try and improve the areas of your cognitive fitness in order to improve those areas. And it's a very useful little tool. It was originally developed as a, a medical tool and available on our UK National Health Service to help people who were at risk of depression. But it's also been tested and found to be very effective in educational applications. But I think the real interest and the excitement for AI is in the potential. The systems that exist today are useful and those that have been well designed and well thought through are particularly useful. But really, for me, it's the potential that's really exciting. Because, you know, the reality of where we are now in the world is not only are we coping with the coronavirus pandemic, but we're also quite well into the early stages of the fourth industrial revolution. And we certainly need to think about what that means for humans. Now, there have been a lot of reports, um, examples of some of the charts in those reports on the screen now that have looked at what does this mean for the workplace? What kind of jobs are going to be the first that will be lost? What kind of skills do we need in the workplace? What should we be doing to help people develop these skills? But in the main, these reports are not necessarily very consistent. They're certainly consistent that people with a good education are less likely to be at risk. And there's some consistency about um, the way in which uh, storage and, and some areas of manufacturing are particularly, and transport are particularly at risk. But actually there's a lot of differences um, between the different reports that have been produced. And I think perhaps that's because we're asking the wrong question. I think we need to see the situation we're in now and made even more so by the pandemic as being a little bit like driving a car in very thick fog along a road that you've never driven along before. And in that situation, a map isn't actually terribly useful. And those reports are very much trying to produce a map. I think what we really need in this situation is to know that we've got a reliable car with good steering, that we've got good lights, that we've got brakes that work, that our tires have a lot of tread on them, that as a driver, we know how to drive, we're not under the influence of alcohol, we're not sleep deprived, we can see well, we can hear well. These are the things that are actually far more important in that situation. And so the equivalent of that sound car and sound driver, I would suggest, are these ways of looking at our complex human intelligence and thinking about how we develop these as we move forward with AI and it's used in education. Because as I say, really our AI systems can only tackle some of the elements of our human intelligence. So we really need to learn how we focus on the elements that we can't automate as well as some aspects of the elements that we can. And so I stress, it's not separate intelligences, it's an interwoven complex whole that's made up of different elements. And five of those elements are about 
meta intelligence or self understanding, whether it's about our thinking, our emotions, about the different contexts that we operate in, or it's about that really valuable understanding what knowledge is, where it comes from, what evidence is good that should make us believe something to be true or not. And if we get that right, then we really can become very accurately self-effective, very good at learning and performing in the world. And this can complement what we can do with our AI. And I think one of the really interesting finesses about the situation with respect to the fourth industrial revolution is that it, the reason that the fourth industrial revolution is happening is partly because we've built very smart AI systems that can learn and that use data in order to learn. And so we think of data as being the new oil. It certainly makes a few companies very wealthy, so it's similar in that respect. But it's also similar in another important respect. Oil is crude until we process it, and so is data. And we need to make sure that we process the data available to us to help us build the kind of educational AI applications that will really help us to build those important elements of our human intelligence to much more sophisticated levels. And in order to do that, we need to understand something about human learning. It's not just the machine learning, it's the human learning that we need to understand so that we can develop our machine learning algorithms and choose wisely from the data that we have to help us understand and monitor and track our advanced human intelligence. I will give you one very small example in the last few minutes of this presentation. This is some work that we've been doing where we look at students who are taking part in collaborative problem solving. And we can, of course, monitor where they're looking, we can monitor where their hands are, we can look at what they're saying, we can look at the interactions they're having with technology. All of these things can be collected. But actually, on their own, they're a bit of a mess. And what you really need is to look at what we've understood about human collaborative problem solving, about human learning, and use that to inform the way that you build your machine learning algorithms to process this kind of data. And I'll give you one very specific example. There's some nice, rich, nice literature, uh, research literature from psychology that demonstrates that actually synchronous eye gaze and synchronous hand movements are associated, it's only a correlation, are associated with effective collaborative problem solving. And that's not to say that if you're looking in the same place and your hands are in the same place, you're necessarily effective in your collaborative problem solving. But it's one small signifier. And there are many of these signifiers that we can identify from learning sciences research and use to design machine learning algorithms. So in this instance, we did indeed do that. And we had a human watch the video and audio of groups of students collaborating and at certain intervals say whether she thought that these this group of students were taking part in effective collaborative problem solving and she was an expert in the field who was not associated with the research and then we also ran our machine learning algorithm over the data that came in about eye gaze and hand movements and in this chart you can see that in groups of three students where the human expert had rated this moment for this group as being effective by high collaborative problem solving, the lines across the screen being closer together indicate that our machine learning algorithm also identified synchronicity in hand and eye gaze. And when the human suggested there was low collaborative problem solving, again, we get a much greater spread, so less synchronicity between the different students. It's one tiny signifier. But if you can imagine lots and lots of multimodal data, i.e. data that captures all the modalities in which we interact, and good AI algorithms that have been designed in a way that takes account of what we understand about human learning. In that example, what we understand from psychology about synchronous action. And you combine that together as an infrastructure like electricity that can power all our interactions. And then importantly, you meld that with 
human intelligence, the human intelligence of teachers who can interpret what the algorithm is saying and help learners to understand what that algorithm is saying and parents and employers too. So it's an infrastructure that combines artificial and human intelligence. And if we can use this to power all our learning interactions, whether it's virtual reality, augmented reality, learning with your phone or computer, or just simply learning on your own, because you understand more about yourself as a learner, you can be more effective at learning. And if you want to know more about this, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Machine Learning and Human Intelligence, and that goes into detail about that interpretation of human intelligence and gives different pieces of evidence and research as to why I believe we can think about human intelligence in that way. And also we have free webinars available at that website on AI readiness, which we've been working on with businesses and educators for a while. But I hope that has set the scene for what's gonna be a great day. Um, some wonderful presentations to come up. So I'm gonna thank you for listening to me and pass over back to Zital to take us to the next step in this tutorial. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Uh, since thank this you. Is, yeah, since this, this is a kind of the online online tutorial, we we may pause here for a bit to just ask the audience if the audience have questions. We can do a the short QA right now. So for the audience, is there any question? Okay, so if, if there's no questions, so I, I will continue to my... And if people want to contact me by email and ask questions, that's absolutely fine. Thank you. Yeah, cool. I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, okay. I will share my screen. Uh, one second. Okay. Share screen. <clears throat> okay, so the uh, in the one second. In in the second part, uh, I need to not sure what happened here. You can see your screen. Seemed like you were presenting just fine. Okay, there's a bar here, so I don't know how to hide the bar. So let me reshare. I don't think we were seeing the Zoom bar if that was what was bothering you. Okay, but cool. It looks great, just to be clear. Right now, like it okay. exists, it says the outline. Okay, cool. So in the second part, so I will talk about uh, the AI in K-12 education, so I will I will, I will have a focus on the K-12 education because the K-12 education is one of the largest part in the general education. So to solve this issue, instead of just... Uh, okay, I will continue. So the, the first the first part in the in, in the first part here, so I will show some existing AI application in K-12 educations. So people, uh, because the majority of the audience may be not quite familiar with uh, what is the current progress of how, how AI is used in the K-12 education. So I will just show a bunch of examples later. Okay, so the first, <clears throat> so when people use AI in K-12 education, there are, may, there are mainly three core values. The first is the cost reductions in the, in the edu education domain, so there are a, a bunch of operations is they have the very high cost. For example, how to prepare the ex how 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 to prepare the exam for teachers, which it costs a lot of money and time. And also, the second core value is improved efficiency. So we will use AI to improve improve the speed and the efficiency in in a lot of problem in education. And the third part is the AI will bring a lot of new experience for education. Uh, when, we, when we look at uh, how 
existing AI, AI application AI application appear in GitHub Education, we can split the entire overflow into six parts. Uh, the first part uh, start with start with the left the the top left corner prepare, which means how AI helps people to pre to to do the prepare. A session in the education. For example, the teacher have to prepare the slides, and the teacher have to do some reflections when after, before they teach a class, and also the teacher have to know how what what kind of knowledge to to teach in the class. So the teacher have to prepare for the class. The second part go to teach, which means the teacher have to know how to teach a class. We, we we right now we have we have the 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 real human teachers and also the AI teachers and also we during when when te when teacher teach the class they they should have a lot of interactions with the students and how can we use AI to improve the quality of the interactions. The third part go to the exercise part. Once we have the once once we have the class, we students usually need to do some exercise. So the, so there are a lot of there are a lot of the tasks in the exercise exercise stage. For example, how pe how the essays are graded by either human or AI, or how the te how the student get a personalized exercise. So the fourth then then we go to the first step. The first step is exam. The, st the, st the student they usually they usually you know have should have. Uh, should have a bunch of the test assessment and exams. So how do we, you know, make how do we come up with a good exam? This is a question. And how do we do the auto grading of the exam? And how do we, how do we make sure people don't copy each other? So the first step is once we have the exam, we basically we want to evaluate the quality of the class, the quality of the students. And there are a bunch of application and tasks. It's like the oral evaluations, the free talk evaluations, and also class quality assurance. Tries to make sure the people can use AI to kind of evaluate both the class and the students. The next step goes to manage. Manage means uh, uh, we need to make sure the teacher perform what what we want and the the entire uh, in the, the the student and their parents are satisfied with the quality of the education service so there are so people so people apply ai you know to improve the quality of the of their call centers and use ai to prevent the, to to use ai to find the uh, at risk student and uh, to do the dropout predictions and also people use ai to find the uh, who is the most suitable teacher for their kids. Okay, so this is kind of the overview of the existing AI application in k Education. So I will, so next I will pick a few very successful examples to show you and give you a concrete ideas. Okay, so the first step, the, fir the first is when in the, in the first stage, the prepare stage, we need to kind of prepare what uh, the, the class materials. So what usually people do is people have to hand uh, handwritten a uh, lot of questions and give those kind of papers to students. Right now with AI, with all the advanced OCR technologies, we can kind of automatically extract the questions from the raw papers and create a better slides and the, the exam. I will show examples here. So the example is the example is in Chinese, but 
the, the, the idea is people can you know, use OCR to automatically extract all the symbols and the equations from the images and they are automatically transformed into the LaTeX form and the people can do all the editing and all the stuff. So the next step is, we, uh, the next example is we can use AI to do the, uh, to the auto content generations. You know, a lot of, uh, right now, a lot of class is online and the students just uh, sit, in, sit, sit at their home and uh, watch all the online videos. And usually uh, the teachers will record their videos and then it will be played by student. One, one question is uh, how do we, how do we, you know, how do we copy a good teacher and to generate more content? So here I, sh I will show examples. So you will see that uh, now we have two teachers. And uh, after using the state-of-the-art computer vision technologies, we can kind of learn all the, all the posts and uh, the actions of one teacher and to use another teacher to, to kind of to drive the, the second teacher. So you see the right now on the left hand side, on the left hand side is a kind of the input of algorithm. We have two teachers, they just perform what they want. It be, will become a kind of a pair of training data. After training the computer vision models, we can generate uh, we can we can generate the the kind of the virtual teacher you see here. You see now we have two teachers, one teacher just the uh, drive the other teachers. So it's kind of, if you, if you watch it uh, uh, not that carefully, you, you probably won't see which one is a real teacher, which one is not. So using this kind of state of the art computer vision technologies and we can build the, uh, we can create the, the auto content generations. Okay, so the third example in the prepare stage is we can use we can use AI to help the teacher improve their teaching effectiveness. So, so here I show three examples. Uh, I, I show three pictures here. So basically, uh, uh, in a lot of schools and also the 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 the, the training and the teaching and services, it require the teacher to keep practicing on their teaching skill. Usually what they do is the teacher just find a, either a whiteboard or kind of a kind of a smart whiteboard. They keep teaching and keep practicing their teaching skills. But uh, the problem is no one gives them feedback. They don't know how well they teach. Usually they just uh, store, they just store their, uh, they just have to record their practice videos and uh, pass it to some senior guys and the guy will tell her, oh, Tell him uh, what uh, what they should improve. Right. So right now with the uh, AI and we can fully analyze the the, rec the the recordings. For example, we can use AI to evaluate the, whether the the verbal is fluent or not, whether the teacher is asking correct questions, whether the teacher have good interaction with the student. Right. So I just I just lead a few kind of metrics AI can help the teachers. Okay, so that, that, that's all about the first stage. That's, then after the prepare stage, we go to the second stage, which is teach, right? How do we use AI to improve the kind of the class, class teaching? So here I will show one example about the, how do we use the smart device to let the, all the students to do the, the in-class oral evaluations. So here's a Ready, go. waterfall. So here I, I just show one example is so so in the offline classroom every student have a, a small device and the device will receive the audio from a student. 
and in the class they can use this kind of device to speak out English words and the system will automatically give a score to each student. So by using this kind of smart device, the teacher can improve the, improve the offline classroom interaction qualities. Hey, Zitao, actually, quick question, because uh, mm -hmm. that sounds really cool. Uh, is it each kid got independent feedback or did the whole, or did it like judge the whole room and kind of say that was mostly close mm -hmm. to waterfall? Yeah, so, so each student uh, will, the, the device will record the voice from each student and it, each student have a score for their pronunciations. And the, the, the system will the, pick the top three and the, put, you know, put the top three's name and pictures on the screen. And the late and at the back end, so every score is record is is recorded, so we can check the we can check the class report later. Impressive, thank you. Yeah. So the next, so the next, uh, so the next video is in Chinese. So I will I will I will I will give some background. So in the offline classroom, usually you know people. Uh, people just sit in the classroom. Usually, the classroom will have twenty or twenty five students. Right. So usually, uh, during the class, usually during the class, all, uh, we have some breaks, right? And also, students students may get bored. And here we create a kind of a special interaction. So we call the we call the body movement exercise. So we will randomly pick two students to kind of to compete with each other. What they compete is they just do their body movement. And they 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 they're supposed to you know to move their body to kind of close to some forms of the functions, the forms of some mathematical functions. So uh, I will show the examples. <laughs> Basically, this example just shows a uh, uh, kind of a special, the special uh, interactions during the class. So we can randomly pick two students to kind of to move their move their body to match the function uh, to move, to match the forms of the function that you you see on the screen. So that's why you see all the students just move their bodies, and we will use CV CV technologies to kind of match their pose. To give a score and evaluated this two the two body movement. Okay, so uh, also there are, you know, there are a lot of people they want to, they uh, they want to use kind of AI to help them to do exercise. So one the one one application is the mental math grading. So the mental math is uh, there are a bunch of very simple 
uh, math questions, and uh, we can use AI to you know take a we can we can use AI to build a camera to take a picture of those kind of homeworks, and we will get the result uh, uh, instantly. And also, we can use we can use AI to you know to build build a kind of a search engine for the question bank, and we take a picture of the question. We will search. We will use that picture to search the entire question bank to find the correct solutions. So here is a demo. <coughs> so we just crop the pictures. And once we crop the pictures, it search the question bank and we find, the, oh, that's the question. And we will, we will either show the solutions or give the student the, the choice to ask ask the question to the teachers and also for the exercise one type of the exercise is the IC is the IC, IC writing and also you know we, we the one of the most famous company is Grammarly and they build a very cool auto auto IC grading tools so here is the example you can set goals for the kind of the IC practice, and after you enter all the all the tags, and it will show you what's wrong with your IC, and you know this. They have a very detailed dimensions to analyze your IC. Okay, and also. For the exercise, right now, uh, recently, so a lot of companies they are building the math tutor to help teach help students. Not, you know, not only check or search the question itself, but also, you know, show you the solutions and then give you the video. You can watch the video to understand the question, to understand the, the knowledge point behind the questions. And there are a bunch of similar apps on the App Store. So, for example, PhotoMath. Microsoft Math, Ada. Ada is by Pearson. So I will show the some some screenshot. For for example, if you see the if you see the middle part of the screen, so the Microsoft Math will help you to do that all the derivative stuff and show you step by step, and also give you the hints. And different from the photo math, both Microsoft and Ada, they have the short video to explain the knowledge point behind this uh, all the math stuff. Okay, and also for the exercise part, once we do the exercise, we check the answer, we check the solutions, we need to do kind of like the diagnostics and also do the assessment. The, the school path is created by the ACT and they have the, they have the, they, they build the tool to do kind of the, to do the dynamic assessment along your, along your learning trajectory. So you see they will load the kind of the student, the, all the student behavior data and they will do the analysis automatically. Yeah, okay. And then we move to the next stage, which is the exam. Exam is probably most, one of the most important part in education. When we do the exam, you're, uh, basically the exam is kind of a special way to evaluate uh, uh, how well we understand uh, the content behind behind the questions, right? So once once we use this stuff, once we do this all this stuff, we can do the adaptive learning. One of the one of the one of the very famous company called the Score AI, which is the kind of the leading adaptive learning companies, and uh, here is uh, here is here is what they do. Through his artificial intelligence based adaptive learning system, Yixue Education Inc. realized five times of learning efficiency for middle school students compared with the traditional approach. 
Students need to take an intelligent knowledge diagnosis assessment at the beginning of studying. This online adaptive test is to quickly and accurately detect students' knowledge weaknesses. In students' learning process, weaknesses are arranged in an optimal sequence, ensuring learning efficiency is maximized. The most suitable learning materials are delivered to students, including short videos, lecture notes, and questions. Each student has a personalized learning path and receives personalized learning contents. Ensure's intelligent adaptive learning system keeps collecting students' learning and behavior data and dynamically adjusts its recommendations according to students' preference, learning style, knowledge state, and proficiencies in real time. <clears throat> okay. And also uh, after after this stage, so we go to the uh, the fifth stage, which is evaluate. How do we use AI to evaluate the, the, the how do we use AI to evaluate the, both the class quality and the, the student the student the student itself? And uh, uh, here uh, <clears throat> we build uh, so at Tel so we build uh, we build kind of. Uh, a uh, special assessment tool we call the, the spoken language profici proficiency assessment tools. We call it Dolphin to to use uh, state of the art of voice recognition and uh, natural language processing techniques to to have a uh, to evaluate the student the spoken language in multiple dimensions. So here is a uh, uh, here is the introductions. In this video, we will introduce you to Dolphin a spoken language proficiency assessment system for elementary education. The system utilizes advanced voice recognition, evaluates a speech from multiple dimensions, and provides assessment reports in real time. In this video, there is a six-year-old boy, Jack, who does his oral assignments by talking about his favorite animals. There are tens of thousands of such assignments to be graded each day. If we grade such huge amounts with traditional manual efforts, there will be problems such as lack of evaluation dimensions, subjective scoring standards, and this whole process is going to be time consuming. To solve these problems, we have developed Dolphin. The core of Dolphin is to evaluate spoken proficiency from multiple perspectives. Let's see how it happens for Jack's video. First of all, audio is extracted and transcribed into text by voice recognition models with high precision. Then voices, texts and images are processed by multiple artificial intelligence algorithms to provide scores from six dimensions. Verbal fluency, topic relevance, coherence, vocal emotion, pose interaction, and vocabulary diversity. Finally, an evaluation report will provide detailed description about Jack's performance. Let's see how Jack's report looks like. On the left side of the screen is a capacity radar chart, which displays the overall scoring. In middle and right sides are details about the dimensions covered in the radar chart. What's more, punchlines, a highlight in his speech, are also captured and shown on the lower right side. Next is an application example of our system. This time, Jack is recording himself speaking, while the system does real-time analysis and captures his highlights. As you can see when Jack said a Chinese idiom, which means jumping around, the interactive interface gave feedback in time to encourage him. Up to now, Dolphin has been in practical use in various scenarios, including entrance examination, in-class interaction evaluation, oral assignment grading, speech contest grading, and etc. The system has played a crucial role in terms of boosting evaluation efficiency and also brought rich and intelligent interactions in education. The system has served more than 50,000 teachers and 3 million students and helped teachers save 500,000 hours that would have been spent on grading assignments. Now you can all experience Dolphin freely via browser at i.100 tall.com Dolphin, 
or scan the cure code on the right hand side with your phone. Let's go try it. Yeah, so this is an example how do we how do we use AI tools to evaluate the spoken language. Uh, next I will uh, so people use AI to uh, to kind of to evaluate the quality of the class. Right now, uh, due to the COVID-19, all, almost all the class moved to online. How do we make sure the class the, the the class have you know have a desired quality? How do we make sure the teacher kind of supposed to supposed to to do what they do and uh, to make sure the overall class class is in a high standard? That's a that's a that's an important question and uh, some of some of the work have already been done to build uh, all the kind of the good behavior and the bad behavior detections to make sure the class the, the overall class qualities and also the uh, and, and and next so we will we will move to the the dropout predictions the, the which helps people to manage the overall the educational system so when the the dropout the job of the prediction is the job of the prediction is kind of old topics. So people do the job of the prediction in public schools, which usually rely on GPA and other stuff. And also people do job out uh, research on MOOC. Well, uh, MOOC is MOOC, MOOC becomes popular about uh, ten years ago, and uh, uh, a lot of people uh, watch the all the videos on MOOC. MOOC platforms like Coursera and all the stuff. And the people, uh, a bunch of research trying to analyze kind of the user behavior on the MOOC platform and to build the machine learning models to, to kind of predict the, the dropout. And also for the K-12 educations, people trying to uh, combine all the information on the platform to predict the dropout. The uh, I would I would mention that the the K twelve student online class dropout prediction is quite different from public school dropout prediction and the MOOC dropout predictions. Usually for the online K twelve students, usually they don't have too many kind of the human behaviors left on the platform. For the MOOC dropout prediction, the most kind of kind of the most important feature is. Uh, is uh, what they left on the platform, right? So, for example, do they post questions on the forum and all the stuff? Or the, how many clicks they make uh, during the class? But for the K-12 online class, you're, usually the K-12 students, they don't type, they don't click, they just watch. And they, that's kind of a huge difference compared to the existing research. And uh, there are a lot of challenges in the K-12 dropout predictions. Okay, so uh, the next is how do we f how do we use AI to to kind of find the, the most appropriate, most uh, suitable teachers for each student? That's a question. That is, if we think uh, if we think about the one on one class, uh, this is more like a matching problem in the bipartite graph. On one side is uh, is all the students, on the other side is all the teachers. How do we do the matchings? Okay, so, uh, so the in the second in the second half of this part, so I will I will quickly go over all the challenges in the AI in K twelve educations. So, briefly, there are kind of four challenges in when applying AI in K twelve educations. The first part is small data. The second part is multi modalities and uh, and uh, heterogeneity. The second, the third part is the data quality issues, and the first part is is about the label consistency and the evaluations. I will, I will, I will introduce each of them later. Okay, so the first part is small data issues. Usually, we we talk about the big data, and actually, I do, uh, in the education domain, uh, we 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 actually is in the big data scenario but there are kind of tons of raw educational data every day for example if you think about all the homework written by students all the classroom recordings both online and offline there are a huge amount of educational data 
However, there are. Uh, however, when we when we trying to build AI applications, we need you know when we we will do the training and we need the labels. So, uh, but uh, in the huge amount of raw educational data, we don't have labels. There are very limited ground truths, and that's the small data issues. The second part, the second the second challenge is uh, multi modalities. Uh, also, uh, as Rose mentioned earlier, so right now uh, we have we have we have a lot of uh, we have different types of classroom nowadays. We have offline classroom, online classroom. Even in even for the offline classroom, we have different uh, types of offline classroom. The same for the online class. We have one on one online class, and we also have a very huge. We have a very huge size online class, so they all, they all, be, they all, uh, they all become popular nowadays. And uh, those kind of the uh, different types of classroom, they give us the multimodal classroom data. Usually, they are they are they they are made <coughs> they are made up of these three types of data: the language data, and the the visual data, and the vocal data. So here is a here is a here is a kind of an example to show you what kind of types of data we can get from the classroom. So it it split the it, it split into two dimension. If you look at the if we look at the uh, the x axis, which is split the uh, which indicate when we generate the data, the data can be generated before the class, in the class, and after the class. And the the y axis it shows uh, who generated the data. It gener the data can be the data can be generated by either the instructor or student or by the administrators. We we can we can uh, we can pick some examples. For example, the uh, if we look at the 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 left top corner, we will see uh, slides preparations. So the instructor have to prepare the slides before the class. Uh, this will this will show. Uh, they, they, so when the when the instructor prepares their slides, there, there are a lot of behaviors left on the platform, and we know what que what questions they pick, and uh, what the knowledge point behind those slides, and uh, this all become very important data afterwards. And also, let's see. Let's see. For example, in class, in class, uh, for the administrators, so we we will we <coughs> we will have the class evaluation and the monitoring, which make sure the class call the class have a have at least uh, the standard qualities. So all this all this analysis will generate a huge amount of data. And also after the class, then have to do the homework assignment, and all this, all this, all this will give you the, the data. Uh, we the, the the third challenge is the data quality issues. We have remember we have we have data we have data from multiple source and they are in multiple modalities. And also, we when we train the models, we we don't have too many labels. And the third challenge is the data quality itself is kind of not that good. For example, for the online class, it's a, uh, if you use kind of the Zoom type of stuff to do the online teachings, usually you have too many. You have you have at least twenty students. So each of the students, uh, they are in kind of in the low resolutions, the from the video, video quality perspective. This is due to the internet speed and other stuff. And uh, also, well, probably you will collect the data from the offline classroom, and the offline classroom data usually is very noisy, and there are a lot of background noises in your data. And also, probably you collect the data from, uh, from the handwriting. For uh, you, you collect the handwriting data from either student or the teachers. Their handwriting are probably very terrible, and it's hard to recognize. 
okay, so when people when people kind of do the when people kind of uh, because the, the all the changes I mentioned in education data, people usually use crowdsourcing to solve the problem. What the crowdsourcing does is once we get, once we show the workers what the data looks like and tell we we usually tell the worker to annotate all the labels, and we can get uh, we can we can sort of kind of alleviate the the small data issues. So here is a kind of a bunch of popular educational uh, tasks using AI. For example, emotion analysis, the fluency detections, the oral evaluations, uh, the the chat detections, and IC gradings. All of these are kind of the popular educational AI tasks. Uh, the the crowdsourcing is very nice things, uh, but however, <coughs> in the educational domain, we have uh, we have the uh, very high inconsistency issues. Usually, if you give a picture, ask the crowd, uh, ask the crowd worker to, to, to kind of to annotate whether it's a cat or whether it's a dog. So usually, the, the, the you will get a very high consistent result, right? So, but uh, in the educational domain, if you ask, if you usually, if you have, if you have multiple workers, usually their consistent ratio is very low. It's, this also bring a, a bunch of challenges when you train the machine learning models. And my colleagues will talk more details later. Okay, so this is, this is the second part. So I, and in the third part, so I will, so we will talk about, uh, we will talk about uh, the multimodal learning in education. And uh, before we go into the kind of all the machine learning details, so let, let 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 me pause here to see if we have some questions. Um, I, you did have one question just about actually uh, pointing to some literature, uh, and I'm actually trying to make the PowerPoints available. Uh, and um, um, that was the only question so far. Um, if someone wanted to ask another question right now, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. So we we have the we have the other reference. We also have all the reference later uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the later, later back of slides. Yeah. At the end of, the, at the, end of the, the slide, we show all the reference. Yeah. Uh, I see, Good. Uh, yeah, I, I see a question. Uh, I, I see the question about the, how is the effectiveness of the AI-based teaching tactics measured? Uh, I, I think right now we do the we do the we do the measurement in two types. The first type is we have we have we build some the uh, the golden test uh, data set, and uh, uh, the the it just help us to do the offline evaluations. And the the another thing we tried is we build the. We build the online, the kind of the online. We do the online A/B test to see whether the teacher, with the teacher, you know, have a better. Well, on the teacher side, whether we have a better acceptance rate, and also on the student side, whether the students are satisfied. We will do the survey and the A/B test to make sure the AI is kind of really effective. Yeah. I guess just following up on that general theme. Because uh, I guess actually you said how this person asked how is the how is it tech, how is it measured, uh, and you kind of responded more with like internally how do we actually maybe improve our product. I was expecting something like hey here's here's the study that actually shows in a randomized controlled trial this thing is better than that. Is does does like I'm not aware of actually how how like so. So here, so here in the United States, we have something called the What Works Clearinghouse, where you can actually get your get your study actually evaluated. Is there is there like a you know a published report on the topic that you're referring to that we want to refer your uh, your question answer to go read, or does that 
Yeah. Yeah. Is there? It, well, here. Um, I'll stop. Uh, what's worth saying on that topic? Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. So. Uh, okay. So now we will move to the third part: the multimodal learning educations, and I, I will. I will. Pass it over to my colleague Goe, which will talk about the more machine learning details about uh, the representation learning in education. Okay, I will stop my sharing. All right, uh, and and let's just talk about time. Uh, when are you thinking? Actually, are are you on time, or how are we doing on time? Yeah, we we we'll, we're on time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Zhitao. All right, uh, can you see my screen? We can. Yeah, yeah we can. Okay, um, hi, uh, I'm Guo Wei. I'm a colleague of Zitao, so I'm also with the uh, TALAI team. Uh, today, I want to talk specifically about uh, representation learning in education domain. Oh, should I just go to the full screen side? It's more. You certainly yeah. could. Just better. There you go. Good. We can see um, your screen well now in full presentation mode. Yeah, yeah. So um, what is the representation of data? So uh, I think representation learning is uh, basically you want to map some raw features into a latent space. And maybe in that latent space, uh, the representation of data would be more robust. So uh, if you just train your model on in that latent space, the task would be uh, easier. So. Let's take a look at this example on the left side. Um, let's say we want to do a binary classification on, on this raw input. Uh, instead of directly training a classifier on the raw input, we could uh, first map it to, into a latent space, like maybe a hundred dimensional hidden states. And then we want, we want uh, in this uh, space such that uh, the positive examples there are close to each other in a cluster and uh, positive and negative examples, they are like far away from each other. So the decision boundary will be clear. So if, if we later train or classify in this latent space, uh, the classification task would be easier. Um, also, um, you know, just graph embedding has also been very popular in recent years. So on the right side, uh, we have a, a map of uh, Wikipedia. So we, also, we can also apply uh, like such a representation learning algorithm to get a uh, representation of nodes and edges. And then we can just uh, do some traditional machine learning algorithm on the learned embeddings. All right, um, so the situation is the same in educational scenarios. So for educational data, we have all different uh, forms of data that come in various sources such as uh, online class videos, questions, textbooks, conversations, homework, handwritings. Uh, still, we can use representation to get a uh, unified kind of uh, embeddings. And then we, we, we can train our uh, machine learning algorithms on it. Mm, next, I will talk specifically about how to learn from limited and inconsistent data. So there are many two challenges that uh, prevent, prevent us from learning a robust representation. The first challenge is that we have small data. The second one is that we have noises, inconsistencies in our cross-source data. So just uh, as Zital mentioned, um, in general, I think uh, educational data, there are, there, are, there are lots of educational data. Uh, like every day we have millions of like online classes going on and we have thousands of homework being uh, uh, graded and uh, submitted. But why, why we still have limited data? The first could be some privacy issues. Maybe students, students don't want their assignments to be uh, recorded. Maybe some teachers, they don't want their classes to be videotaped. So we actually don't have access to this data. And the second reason could be that um, Labeling educational data is really subjective and much harder than some traditional tasks such as labeling images. So for example, I'll give you a very quick example. So let's say we want to build a online class quality judger. So to do that, we need a lot of uh, class quality 
but to labels. However, just normal people couldn't label these classes because it requires years of teaching experience. And also, um, on the other hand, you have to watch the entire classes, which may be one or two hours long before you can make a conclusion. So it all makes uh, labeling educational data very expensive. That gives us uh, small data. So how do we deal with small data? Uh, Many there are two approaches. One is model-wise, the other is data-wise. So uh, in, for model-wise uh, approaches, uh, basically we, we want to transfer or reuse some previous learned knowledge uh, and, generate, and generalize that knowledge to our target task. For example, um, in recent years, the very famous BERT model in NLP, um, they are pre-trained on two uh, pre-trained tasks, uh, language modeling and also next sentence prediction. So in this pre-training stage, the model just kind of learns some common senses about languages. And then we can generalize that knowledge to other tasks such as text classification, question answering, and so on. And sometimes it's also very useful to just to utilize some expertise. So we inject some extra knowledge into our model for better performance. Uh, we can just maybe uh, uh, put some domain ex expertise priors or introduce knowledge graphs into our model. And for the data-wise, usually we apply data augmentation to obtain a, a, a larger and better training set. So next, I want to um, talk about the differences between the three, uh, three ways to transfer knowledge. Uh, one is the transfer learning. So in, for transfer learning, there's only one source task and one target task. They are different, but they share some similarities. Uh, for example, let's say let's, the source task is that we want to evaluate the uh, speaking fluency of women's voice. And the target task could be to evaluate the uh, fluency of men's voice. So they are, they're kind of different, but they share uh, similarities. So in, that guarantees that we can uh, reuse the knowledge from the source task. And for multi-learning tasks, really the difference is that we have uh, multiple tasks going on. So the model is trained on this multiple task uh, jointly to capture their intrinsic uh, dependencies. And for meta-learning, uh, we, we train our model on multiple tasks and uh, to generate that knowledge to an unseen, to a new task. But sometimes it's actually much, much faster to just incorporate prior knowledge. Let's say, for example, in this picture, uh, we want to predict the probability of heart failure uh, given patient's history and uh, symptoms to descriptions. So um, let's say this doctor, this expert told us that um, a high blood pressure and artillery disease, there are two key factors. So to build our model, we could simply just put um, very positive priors on these two factors, and that could make the model more uh, robust. So um, in the last few slides, I talk about how to deal with small data issue from uh, the point of uh, model. So I, actually, we could also think about this problem from the point of data. So how do we do data augmentation? Um, usually, we can use some handcrafted rule or just apply augmentation strategies to get more data. So uh, in my practice, uh, I used to build a, a English grammar uh, correction model. So the model can take some sentences with arrows and uh, returns a sentence that has been corrected. So to do that, we need lots of uh, sentences with grammatical arrows. And one way, one rule is that we can randomly delete or uh, insert or just uh, shuffle some characters to generate arrows. And recently, um, generative model has also been very popular. So I've already seen that uh, uh, generative models such as scan has been applied in CV to generate uh, very realistic images. Um, however, the, the, the reality is usually that uh, in, your train, in your data, only a small portion of the data is labeled. So still lots of data, they are still unlabeled. But if you want to take advantage of both, you may uh, use this so-called semi-supervised learning. 
So for example, I, uh, I, I can just train my classifier, classifying model on the label of data and then make predictions on all my unlabeled data. And then I, I select those uh, unlabeled data that fall close to the decision boundaries. And then I, I can in introduce crowdsourcing to get those unlabeled data, the, the, the label of those unlabeled data and append them to our training data set. And that just boosts the overall pro, uh, performance. Okay, uh, I, I, I've introduced a small data problem and how do we deal with that? Uh, next, I will talk about the inconsistency of uh, cross-source data. So uh, this simple uh, example, let's look at this uh, picture. So it has, uh, it says KDT 2020 with two sailboats and ocean. And we, if we just show this picture to our crowdsourced workers and ask them where was KDD 2020 plan to hold, um, you can, as you can see, they give very conflicting answers because this question is really hard, given that San Francisco and San Diego, they're both seaside cities. So how do you really find the true answer? How do we find the true label of the task? This is called truth inference. And by definition, choose inference uh, means that given different task answers collected from workers, the target is really to infer the truth of different tasks. So there are actually, uh, there are a very simple solution is to that, to take the answer that is voted by the majority of the workers. This is called a uh, majority vote. But uh, majority vote actually uh, treats each worker equally. So it doesn't consider that the diversity quality for each worker. This is especially, um, it has limitations, especially when your worker, they vary in their expertise. And to solve that problem in 2009, and Whitehill, they um, introduced a model called GLAB. So in this model, uh, both the difficulty of the object and the expertise of the laborers that both consider to model the probability of the observed labels. So if you take at this formula, um, let's say an uh, I means the ith worker and alpha I just means that the ac labeler accuracy of the ith worker and beta means the difficulty of the task. Uh, beta J in actually indicates the task difficulty of, uh, the, of the J's images. So if, uh, if a, a task is easy and the labeler is very accurate, the probability of the observed label is very high. Okay, um, I've introduced a, uh, a few approaches to deal with uh, small data, but still, we, we still might have very few trainable labels. And uh, next I will talk about a novel framework called RLL. Uh, this work was published in ICD by TLAR team. So the first part of RL is called the grouping-based architecture. Really, this is really just to deal with the small data problem. Um, let's use this example, uh, the classification as our example again. Let's say we still have um, very limited data. We have N positive and N negative data on the left side. And if we just directly training our classifier on this limited data, the, the performance isn't really good. So instead of doing that, and how do we just uh, increase the, the, the size of our training that we could do grouping. So on the right side, we, we can select two positive examples in blue and K negative examples in red. We, we group them together to form groups. And later, you can, uh, I will show how do we uh, feed this group into a new network to train, uh, to get a robust representation. Uh, what I really want to say is that uh, by this grouping architecture, we can get substantially more data. Now we already have a large training uh, group data sets. Next, we need to consider how to reduce the negative impacts of noisy cross-source labels. So how do we deal with inconsistency? So still, uh, uh, let's say we have uh, example A and example B here, and we ask five workers to, to label them, either as positive or negative. 
So you see example A has three positive out of five workers. Example B has five uh, positive votes. So obviously we, we are confident to say that example B is, is, uh, is, is very positive, but we are not sure about the, la the true label of example A. So they should be treated uh, differently in our model training. And based on this intuition, we want to give each data a confidence score and treat this confidence score as a random variable. So one way to treat the confidence score as a random variable is, to, is that we can use maximum likelihood estimation. Um, according to MLE, so example A will have uh, with the sum of uh, all the positive votes for example A would be three and divided by five workers. So the, the score of example A would be three divided by five, by five point, uh, is point six and example B would have a score equals to five divided by five, which is uh, one. However, uh, MLE has limitations, especially when the number of workers is very small. So to, to better infer the true uh, labels, we can actually introduce some Bayesian priors into the calculation of this confidence score. So here, just we can introduce alpha and beta as our label class uh, priors. Okay, um, now for ARIA, we already have a large training data set and confidence score estimators. So the third, third part is really how do we do model training? So on the left side of this uh, graph, we feed the grouping, we feed all the groups into a neural network to do nonlinear projections. And through projection, we can get their embedding in the latent space. And then the, on the right side, the, the, the loss function is really, we want to uh, maximize the probability of retrieving a positive example, xj, given another positive example xi, together with k negative examples. So in other words, we want in our latent space that uh, all the positive examples to be close to each other and uh, uh, positive and negative examples need to be far away from each other. And also to deal with inconsistency, uh, we also integrate confidence score into the loss function. Uh, such that uh, examples with inconsistent labels contribute less to the loss and examples with uh, confident labels contribute more to the loss. So um, as, I, as I introduced in RIL, the grouping are done with random strategy. So we just random pick, pick up ran, uh, positive and negative, negative examples together. However, this is not the most efficient way to create groups because um, maybe in, in some in our data uh, sets, maybe some data, their, their distribution are easy to capture. So we don't want them to repeat our training groups again and again. So this year we actually uh, introduced a hard example mining strategy into RLL. So hard example uh, mining strategy is a uh, iterative algorithm. At iteration T, we first make predictions on the validation sets using current learned embeddings. And then we, since we know all the labels for the validation sets, we could find those mispredicted examples in the validation sets. Let's, let's call them just validation hard examples. Then we want to find the most similar examples to these hard validation examples from the training sets. Uh, this can be done using various distance metrics, such as Euclidean distance, cosine similarity, L1, L2, and et cetera. And finally, for the next iteration, T plus one, we form groups with this training hard, uh, training hard examples. And this helps the model to converge faster and obtain robust representations. Um, but besides hard example mining strategy, we can actually use a sampling network to select examples before grouping. So uh, this work is called uh, hard example uh, while sampling network. So it has three steps. Um, in step one, we, did, did, we decide if an example is a safe one 
based on its cross-source labels and embeddings in the latent space. In step two, we generate a robust anchor for each group. And finally, in step three, we utilize a sampling network to help us select those hard examples from all the possible training groups. I will talk them about them in details later. So here, uh, I will explain what is a safe and unsafe example. So let's, let's see this uh, example on the left side. Uh, so on the top, uh, this example has six positive votes out of seven annotators. So we still need to, comp uh, to compute the confidence score, which is uh, six minus 3.5 divided by 3.5, which is uh, five over seven. So I, I can say that this, this one is a very confident example, is a safe one. Mm, but for the second example um, below, it has only four votes out of seven annotators. So the confidence score uh, goes down to one over seven. And, and how, how do we decide if an example is safe? We need to go to the latent space. So uh, actually the, the idea is that we, for any example in the latent space, we want to look at its neighbors. So if the neighbors, the, the majority of the neighbors, they, they have a, a class label different from the, the example studied, we think this one is an unsafe one. So for example, uh, on the right side, on the top, this blue one is a negative, but all, all its neighbors, there are positive examples. So we believe that this blue one is unsafe. However, uh, the example below is actually very safe because all of is this uh, five examples, there are negative ones. And later when we form groups, uh, the safe examples will have a higher probability to be selected, but the unsafe example would be ha will have a low probability to be selected in our training groups. And next, we want to get a robust anchor uh, for each uh, training groups because we are still worried that there might be some ambiguous anchors in our uh, training groups. So that may harm the model and we want to get rid of them. So how do we do that? The intuition is that we deep believe the overall average is, is much safer than any individual sample. So to reduce the influence of ambiguous anchors and anchors within a batch are replaced with a robust anchor. The robust anchor is, is uh, the weighted average of the original anchors by their confidence score as shown by this formula on the right side. And the final step of uh, this framework is the sampling network. Uh, different from the hard example mining strategy I introduced uh, before, we here, we, we introduce a sampling network to help us select the hard examples. So we define this hardness as that uh, for any group, if it contributes a lot of, uh, if its, its contribution to the loss function is large, we think this is a hard group. So uh, we train such sampling network as a supervised uh, model. And the, the model just take groups as input and predict uh, the hardness of this group. And later for the next iteration, we use the sampling network to rank all the possible groups. And we take only the groups with very high uh, hardness scores and take them into the uh, training groups for the next iteration. Okay, I think that's all my introduction and uh, I will pause here for any questions. I just wanna say, actually, that seems like some really important work, actually, I'm glad to learn uh, about it. Uh, uh, and I saw how you were citing Jacob Whitehill's GLAD, actually, algorithm. Jacob works with me at WPI. Uh, okay. I definitely need to learn about Actually, your technique seems really cool since I'm actually going to talk all about crowdsourcing. Uh, it seems like actually um, I need to really comprehend actually your work because it seems really important. I don't, there's not Thank a question you. in there. It's more just a compliment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay, if no other question, I will stop sharing. And next, uh, let's invite Hao Yang, my colleagues, to 
uh, to introduce the learning from multiple uh, modality. Okay, thank you, Guowei, and I will share my screen. Okay, give me a second. Let's see where the bottom is. Oh, I'm still not so familiar with uh, Zoom. I cannot seem to find the bottom. The um, here, I'll just I'll just start sharing to actually kick you off. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Actually, stop sharing. Uh, and, Thank you. Uh, sure. So could you see my screen? Uh, yes, ex uh, educational representation learning, and now you're in presentation mode. Proceed. Yeah, okay. So hello, everyone. I'm Hao Yang. I'm a colleague of Guowei and Zhao. Uh, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to introduce some progress in multimodal machine learning in educational theme. And in general, a modality refers to the way in which something happens or is experienced. We may associate the word modality with the sensory modalities such as vision or touch. Uh, and to understanding the world around us, artificial intelligence needs to be able to interpret and reason about multimodal messages. There's a wonderful survey paper on the topic of multimodal machine learning on TPAMI in 2019. And in this paper, it summarized five core technical challenges on multimodal machine learning. They are representation that is learning to how to represent and summarize multimodal data and translation to map data from one modality to another, and alignment, identify relations between elements from different modalities, and fusion, drawing information from modalities to perform a prediction and co-learning, to transfer knowledge between modalities, their representation, and their predictive models. And multimodal machine learning enables a wide range of applications, such as speech recognition and synthesis, event detection, emotion, and media description, and multimedia retrieval. And each of them are relevant to two or more uh, technical challenges. For example, in emotion recognition, we have acoustic signals, uh, image information, and test. And to capture the interaction among different modalities, we may want to align image and speech signals to the test in the temporal domain, fuse these features to, uh, to make predictions or learn a shared representation. Also, you may use tests to improve visual representations for uh, emotion classification by transfer learning, one of co-learning approaches. Uh, a first fundamental challenge is learning how to represent and summarize multimodal data. Uh, the heterogeneity of multimodal data makes it challenging to construct such representations. For example, language is often symbolic, while audio and visual modalities will be represented as signals. There are two categories of uh, multimodal representation, drawn and coordinated. Drawn representations combine the unimodal signals into the same representation space. If you look at the figure on the left-hand side, you will see uh, unimodal representation x1, x2 to xn are fed into a shared function or structure to learn a drawn representation. Well, coordinated, uh, on the right hand side, process unimodal signals separately, which means those blue dots and red dots don't share with each other, but enforce certain similarity constraints on them to bring them to what we term a coordinated space. A second challenge addressed how to translate or map data from one modality to another. Given an entity one modality, the task is to generate the same entity in a different modality. Uh, there may be a number of correct ways of translation and one perfect translation may not exist. Translation can be uh, categorized into two types, example-based and generative. Example-based models in figure 2a use a dictionary when translating between modalities. And generative models, on the other hand, uh, construct a model that is able to produce a translation. Figure 2b shows you that in the uh, in the training stage, a uh, model such as grammar-based model or encoder-decoder model learns from model and learns from data and then translate data from source modality to target modality. The distinction between example-based and generative approaches is similar to the one between um, non-parametric machine learning and parametric machine learning. 
The third challenge is to identify the direct relations between sub-elements from two or more different modalities. For example, give a movie, aligning it to the script or the book chapters it was based on. As the figure shows, an event happened in P1 in modality, in modality 1 uh, may be in correspondence to the event in T4 in modality 2. To tackle this challenge, we need to measure similarity between different modalities and deal with possible long-range dependencies and ambiguities. We categorize multi-model alignment into two types, explicit and implicit. In explicit alignment, we are explicitly interested in aligning subcomponents between modalities. Uh, for example, aligning recipe steps with the corresponding is, uh, instrumental uh, video. An implicit alignment is used as an intermediate of a latent step for another task. For example, image retrieval based on task description can include an alignment step between words and image regions. And the fourth challenge is to join information from two or more modalities to perform a pre prediction. And for example, for audiovisual speech recognition, the visual description of the lip motion is fused with the speech signal to predict spoken words. Uh, we categorize multimodal fusion into two types, model agnostic approaches and model-based approaches. Historically, the vast majority of multimodal fusion has been done using model agnostic approaches. Such approaches can be split, split into early and late and hybrid uh, fusion. Early fusion integrates features immediately after they are extracted, often by simply concatenating their representations. For example, if you look at the figure, we concatenated audio uh, feature, uh, we can, the feature, audio feature in blue dots and visual feature in green dots as input for the next layer. And late fusion, on the other hand, performs integration after each of the modalities has made a decision, uh, for example, classification or regression. Finally, hybrid fusion combines the outputs from early fusion and individual unit model predictors. And an advantage of model agnostic approaches is that they can be implemented using almost uh, any unit model classifiers or regressors. And now let's move on to model-based methods. Uh, three categories of approaches are designed to perform uh, multimodal fusion. First, multiple kernel learning methods are an extension to kernel support vector machines that allows for the use of different kernels for different modalities of the data. And graphical models are another family of popular methods such as conditional random fields and factorial hidden Markov models. And finally, neural networks have been used extensively for the task of uh, multimodal fusion. The general idea is fusing information in joint hidden layer of a neural network. Uh, the, at the last, the uh, first uh, challenge is to transfer knowledge between modalities, their representation and their predictive models. Co-learning explores how knowledge learning from one modality can help a computational model train on a different modality, particularly when one of the modalities has limited resources such as annotated data and noisy input. Uh, in parallel data in the leftmost figure, both modalities share a set of instances, uh, for example, audio recordings with the corresponding videos. Uh, on the other hand, non-parallel methods don't require the modalities to have shared instance, uh, but only shared categories or concepts. Non-parallel um, co-learning approaches can help with learning representations, allow for better semantic concept understanding. In the hybrid data setting, as you can see from the rightmost figure, two non-parallel modalities are bridged by a shared modality or data set. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, multilingual image captioning, the image modality will always be paired with at least one caption in any language. Uh, so here's the taxonomy of multimodal research we mentioned earlier. And we will now come to educational tasks with multi-modalities. A wide range of tasks are implemented in two stages. For example, in order to assign grades to written essays, uh, first we convert images of handwriting to tests with OCR, and in stage two, uh, machine learning models are trained to assign grades. Another example is classroom conversation analysis. 
to detect and analyze certain types of uh, the logic instructions. Conversation tests must be extracted from uh, audios by uh, automatic speech recognition. And the second category of educational tasks are single stage tasks as data in educational scene, especially classroom data, is multimodal naturally. And multimodal data, including language, visual, and vocal data will contribute to, multi, uh, to machine learning tasks together. For the sake of time, I will focus on this, uh, the following four tasks, uh, verbal fluency detection, dropout prediction, emotion analysis, and class activity detection. And some of them are, were mentioned by Zitao earlier. I will provide some uh, technical details. Let's get started with spoken language proficiency. Uh, spoken language proficiency is crucial for personal development. However, students in developing countries are too shy to express themselves or barely have chances to uh, speak in classes, and as a result, fail to reach satisfactory levels of spoken language proficiency. So we created verbal fluency tasks which allow students practice their oral language skill at home and develop a dolphin system to automatically uh, provide feedback from six aspects, that is verbal fluency, topic relevance, vocabulary diversity, and post-interaction coherence and verbal emotion. Dolphin system helps students practice oral skill and at the same time reduce the burden of repetitive reading workloads for teachers. Uh, it's a multimodal task as the Dolphin system scores students' performance from their videos. And here's the overall workflow for uh, verbal fluency. When the video clip arrives, we extract this audio track and transcribe it into tests by ASR uh, for phonolog uh, phonological fluency scorer. In the upper side of the figure, we extract features from both audio tracks and ASR transcripts and concatenate them as early fusion the feed them into a group-based neural network. Uh, as shown at the bottom of the figure, we also proposed a semantic relevance scorer to identify whether a student is talking about irrelevant topics, which uses a cross multiple attention mechanism to extract the uh, semantic relation between answers and questions, and then predicts a relevance score. Um, both offline and online experiments demonstrate the effectiveness of our approaches. So now let's turn our attention to students who drop off the class. Uh, in spite of the advantages of online classes, a large group of online K-12 students fail to finish course programs with little supervision either from their parents or teachers. It may be due to many reasons, such as uh, lack of interest or confidence, mismatches between course contents and students' learning passes, or even no immediate great improvements from their parents' perspectives. And therefore, it's crucial to build an early uh, dropout warning system to identify such at risk unlike K-12 students and provide timely interventions. We applied an early fusion approach to a distinguished set of features, which can be divided into, into three categories. The first is in-class features that focus on K-12 students' online behaviors during the class. And the second is out-of-class features that consider real-world factors happened after the class, which may uh, influence the dropout decisions. And the third, time-variant features that include both historical performance of teachers and aggregated features of student activities within fixed size windows. And all of these features are concatenated to train a grading-boosting decision tree. In our offline experiments, our method improved the dropout prediction performance when compared to state-of-the-art baselines on a real-world uh, educational dataset. And in uh, online experiments, the results show that more than 70% of dropout students are detected by the system. And next, we'll talk about emotions. Emotions are an integral part of a class and are experienced in teacher-student interactions quite often. Uh, given a video of a class, facial, experience, uh, facial expression and uh, emotional voices can be captured. And on the other hand, sentiment analysis on what they speak may also provide clues for emotion recognition. Learning from multi-modalities will be beneficial as it captures the interaction between speech and the test. And here's the architecture of the proposed model uh, on the right. Uh, the yellow part indicates the speech encoder and the right part indicates the 
test the encoder and the blue part is the multimodal fusion network consisting of an uh, attention network to fuse both speech and test modalities and an LSTM is followed for sequential classification. And this architecture outperforms other existing methods on the IE MOCAC dataset. Uh, okay, next let's take a look at the classroom activity detection. Uh, here are some photos taken in our offline uh, one on one class. This, there is one student with one teacher in the classroom, and the video is recorded with, uh, with the recorder away from them to minimize its influence on teaching. Uh, in order to help teachers get instant feedback on their uh, pedagogical instructions and improve educators' teaching skills, we need classroom activity detection, which focused on accurately classifying whether the teacher or student is speaking, uh, recording both the length of individual utterance during a class, as you can see in the bottom of the figure. And it's also a multi-model uh, task as we have data from both vocal and language modalities. Uh, the architecture shown in this paper, uh, in this page, briefly illustrates how to distinguish what the student says from the teacher. Uh, first, the video is cut into many short segments, uh, and we measure similarities between each two segments by their vocal features to cluster the segments. Then we can classify these clusters using test features of each segment extracted from a semantic embedding. Uh, the similarity calculation as well as clustering are implemented with an intentional, uh, with an intention layer. Uh, this approach is able to outperform, uh, to outperform a state of the art baselines on classroom data. Uh, oh, oh, that's it. Uh, due to limited data, maybe we can uh, discuss some questions in the chat area. Uh, uh, next, let's, please allow me to introduce the next speaker, Professor. Uh, Neil, and uh, he's an expert in assessment, and uh, he will talk about uh, algorithmic, uh, algorithmic uh, assessment and evaluation. Don't come take my class, actually thinking you're gonna be able to keep your camera off. So, all right, so who the hell am I? I'm actually Professor Neil Heffernan, actually, and I got at least learned one person actually had, had difficulty during these COVID times, actually, and I didn't get to know anybody about actually which math textbooks or software you're aware of, but these are gonna be really important. Uh, and so, um, so anyways, I'm a professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I teach artificial intelligence, uh, and I have actually over 80 peer reviewed actually papers, uh, where we're doing educational data mining, where we're trying to actually build slightly better predictive algorithms. Uh, and most of the time, those actually slightly better algorithms aren't really important. Uh, and, uh, um, it's really easy as an academic to fool yourself into thinking you've done something important just because you get slightly better predictive sorts of stuff. What I'm going to talk a little bit about is actually how do we actually use these slightly better predictive sorts of stuff to actually, uh, or actually, how do we use these predictive algorithms to take action? Because what it's really all about is, predict, is, is taking action. Uh, and so I'm going to actually try to tell you about some of that. And in particular, the taking action, when I think about taking action is I've actually published 24 peer reviewed randomized control trials using assessments as a platform. Um, what we really want to do is figure out what should we give to a given kid actually um, of the options that we actually have for them, right? Like that is what this is supposed to all be about. Uh, otherwise we're just like predicting stuff and it's not actually very interesting to me. So, um, um, all right. I, um, um, the last time I was at KDD, actually my student actually won actually the best, uh, one of the best student prizes for the KDD Cup. I think that was in 2010. Uh, and so I actually think of myself as a KDD type researcher, uh, though I actually don't often show up uh, at KDD because it's not actually, on average, not actually very educationally orientated. Uh, and so I care, um, in fact, my PhD student, March, who has his video on, actually has helped me run two big competitions uh, where we actually got over 70 researchers, I think in both cases to actually, uh, in this case, um, do data mining on actually um, what's called the nation's report card here in the United States. Actually, uh, I already mentioned something in the chat about actually the US Department of, of Education's Institute for Education Sciences. They run something called the What Works Clearinghouse. I'll mention that again. Uh, in a bit, but they also run the nation's report card or what's called NAEP, that is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Uh, and we ran a competition to try to actually help data miners do something really important, which is help 
help actually look at the clickstream data uh, while children are doing NAEP uh, to figure out, uh, can we build a model of actually which kids are going to essentially stop working on the NAEP exam? It's a huge problem in the United States because NAEP actually helps us keep the trend line in America. We can't tell if actually kids are getting better or worse if over time, maybe actually kids are less likely to pay attention on NAEP. Uh, uh, and so we, we ran this competition. Um, and by the way, all these competitions are publicly available, release data sets, and I encourage people to come along and beat the crap out of actually my students and myself and others to try to actually do a better job of making these predictive algorithms. Um, uh, a year and a half ago, actually, uh, we ran a, a competition using assessments data sets. Uh, and um, in that case, we were using seventh grade state tests, seventh grade use of assessments to predict who actually goes, um, who actually goes into a STEM career. Um, yes. I really mean that, yes, we actually were trying to predict 10 years after they used their seventh grade math software, actually, how are they doing? Uh, and uh, uh, we had already actually published a series of papers related to who actually finishes, who, who does well on their state exam in seventh grade, who actually goes on to college, who goes into a STEM career. And so it was logical for us to actually then run a competition in saying who goes into uh, a STEM job. Um, and. Uh, Everyone talks about early dropout detectors to figure out who actually drops out. Wouldn't it be great if we had an early losing interest in STEM actually detector? Uh, and so we did, we, did, we did this competition. So um, um, pretty much everything I'm gonna talk about, actually all the papers I've done gonna talk about um, will mostly actually all be involving places where we've released data sets. Uh, I'm really pleased to the fact that because I've released a lot of data sets, I'm aware of at least 43 papers uh, that have actually used our open data sets. Uh, and I think there's six different types of data sets that I see getting used a lot. And uh, a lot of people have used the assessments data sets, data sets number one and two actually listed on here. Um, and my team is actually releasing um, new data sets this year, and particularly we're releasing actually uh, in the next few weeks, um, a data set on before COVID and after COVID. Uh, um, and that will include a bunch of stuff that is not actually typically released or we've never released in the past, including among other things, data that would actually would actually help us do stuff like, did your teacher actually during COVID times check on their assessment reports. Uh, can we see which kids are likely to drop out uh, and stop working? Because let's be clear, we all know during these COVID times, okay, that actually lots of kids are gonna stop working. Uh, and uh, uh, it was already happening before COVID. We have a big problem, at least here in America, getting kids to stay focused. And we still lose, only 25% 20, only of American kids don't finish high school. Uh, and so, um, yeah, 25% of kids still in 2020 are not finishing high school. So we have lots of kids dropping out of school. And during this COVID times, we're going to have more and more kids actually failing to actually proceed. So how do we build software that will hopefully help teachers keep their kids interested and engaged and moving forward? So um, um, uh, I can't do any of this without actually mentioning my wife. My wife actually runs the Assistance Foundation, uh, and we both met teaching middle school math in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I was a Teach for America kid, and my wife was a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, 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 and I appreciate the, the smile, uh, actually, uh, and it's important to have an audience. Uh, and, um, um, and so anyways, my wife actually is out gardening right now, actually during this pandemic, actually she said, I'll just stay out of the kitchen, dear. Um, but really she and I actually lead a big team of actually people. Uh, if I have some superpower in life, it is not invisibility or the ability to fly, but I write grants well. And so I have a big team actually at the university that are helping me. Uh, I'll wind up talking about them. But what is assessments? It's just a dumb platform that teachers can use to build their own content and assign problems. Or And, and by the way, when I say content, I really mean to say problems and feedback. Uh, most of the teachers are mostly focused on, I want to assign these problems that my kid already has uh, or, uh, and, uh, or that my, my, my school bought this textbook or actually my school is using this open educational resource, or I decided to use this open educational resource. I'm gonna to talk to you about that in a second. But teachers 
draw questions from our library or make their own stuff. Uh, students get in instructional assistance while teachers get assessment, thus the name assistments. And I will point out that actually the six letters of assisting is actually the insisting part, which is actually the, that's the important part. It's really not about the assessment, uh, though actually we got kind of famous like 15 years ago because we did a good job of predicting who does well on their state test. But every seventh grade teacher already knows who's going to do well and who's not going to do well. That's not very interesting. Um, uh, how do we actually help them, though, uh, is, is interesting. So if you go to assistance, you can actually learn a little bit about it. This is actually the main site. Um, and there's these open educational resources. Uh, um, uh, and um, um, half of American teachers say they've actually used Engage New York uh, or Eureka Math one of these freely available actually things. Basically in America, we actually have a little bit of a revolt against some of these traditional textbook makers. Uh, and so that actually has provided a lot of actually use. Um, but we've actually also taken actually a bunch of other textbooks and a big study we're gonna talk about that was in the What Works, that got us into the What Works Clearinghouse, got me invited to the White House back in, at a time when you still wanted to get invited to the White House. Uh, in 2016, um, and uh, because we took every textbook in the state of Maine uh, and did a big, huge study. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a second. I'm also going to tell you about Skill Builders. Skill Builders is our version of something that is adaptive, uh, where kids keep working until they get three right in a row, and we have something like 300 actually Skill Builders. The data set that I mentioned a second ago, the most commonly used data set from assessments in publications, at least like 20 odd researchers have used actually the assessments data set, mostly about the skill builders. Uh, and, uh, um, and so, but March and some of my team are helping me actually uh, show something else off. Anyways, I wanna show you actually how a teacher assigns something in, uh, in our OER, OER is, the, is our term of art for open educational resource. Um, so um, this actually is a video actually showing if you go to assessments right now, and you click on say a lust for mathematics and you click on say seventh grade and you're doing unit two and you actually click practice problems. And maybe you're a teacher and you're on lesson two. Teachers can pick which problems they wanna do. They can scroll down. Oh, I want this one. I don't want this one. Um, if you were a student here in America, you know your teacher picks some questions and hands them out to you. Here actually I'm demonstrating actually go, uh, assigning Google Classroom uh, and uh, the name of the class happens to be class with Vincent. I just gave a talk at Carnegie Mellon where I came from. I'm going to go click on view here in this example. Now we're into Google Classroom. If you don't know about Google Classroom, it's the fastest growing learner management system used in the United States. We did a simple integration with Google Classroom. We're still in Google Classroom. Here we're looking from a teacher perspective. The teacher hits this button. Now they're back at assessments and now they can see that the one person in my class named Christina Heffernan actually has, has done nothing, but that's because I just assigned it. Uh, and uh, here I'm just going to demonstrate from the user perspective. Here's a kid. Now I'm demonstrating as a kid. Uh, I'm opening. I'm answering an open ended question uh, with a like a gaming sort of uh, sort of answer, and I'm clicking through some hints just to demonstrate what hints are. And they're eventually correct answer is four. Type four. Boom. Uh, and go on to the next problem. Maybe we'll. Who, who knows what? I, I don't remember whether I got this problem right or wrong. Oh no, the video ends here. Um, anyways, I showed you two problems inside assessments. So the builder is important too. Actually, in fact, actually, if you want to understand how assessments is different than many actually commonly available actually things, it's really about uh, teacher choice, teacher creation. Uh, and so it is an anathema to us uh, that actually you'd actually anyone would use an educational product that doesn't allow teachers to modify and put themselves in the place of doing this. But every MOOC on the planet, actually, it's not about that at all. Uh, and so anyways, um, I'll say a little bit more about that. I'm going to play a little video to just demonstrate. Uh, we have a really stupid builder. Again, I got a dumb platform, okay? Uh, and, and then we build some smiley intelligent things around it. Anyways, a person can say, what is plus two plus three and put in the answer of five and they can type in a hand, count on your fingers. Uh, and now that's inside our system. Uh, and um, I think we can actually ask a question. I think I, I, think I was like, yeah, what are the causes of the civil war? And I'm sure I don't even bother spell checking this stuff because I just made this video very quickly. Um, and clearly the answer has got to have something to do with slavery or you don't understand what's going on. Uh, and uh, um, I think this video might actually demonstrate we're going to play that uh, thing here. Um, oh, one thing we do a lot of is actually algebra. Since we're a math site, 
actually, I think I'm now about to demonstrate in this video. Uh, hey, uh, you know, essentially put this in slope intercept form, uh, 4x plus 2y equals 12. Uh, and uh, um, as you might imagine, our system does the right algebra. So if a child actually puts it, puts this in, um, puts this in actually wrong. Um, anyway, we're, we're, we're making a problem right now and we're gonna put in the answer uh, and uh, I can't, my mental math is actually really bad, so I can't really remember how to do this really quickly, but luckily I made a stupid video here. I'm gonna actually hit actually create on this little video. And then I think I'm actually also gonna demonstrate, um, uh, uh, all right, I actually had to mark the answer type here and then hit create. Uh, you'll see my AI class is actually listed here, WPI Teach AI CS4341. And um, uh, now we've made a problem set, actually, that's the builder. Okay, um, and uh, I just actually, uh, I just left, I left my video, boom, 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 okay, here we go. In a nutshell, so we're a dumb learner management system platform that gives actually teachers the ability to find, modify, create new problems for their students to practice on and give, uh, and give due dates and, and then reports. Um, and I wrap actually some interesting supports around what teachers want to do, or at least that's our goal. Um, and in particular in this talk, I'm mainly gonna focus on actually my vision uh, of actually, how do we actually use platforms like mine to actually um, crowdsource stuff? Um, and um, I, um, many of us that are programmers know like Stack Overflow is amazing. Like who hasn't actually typed in, uh, typed in a question and you got Stack Overflow comes up with an answer. Wikipedia is amazing. Why don't we actually have this in K-12 where we actually have platforms that allow us to crowdsource uh, stuff from teachers. So while I teach artificial intelligence, I don't believe in artificial intelligence. I tell all my students I don't believe in artificial intelligence. I believe in teacher intelligence. How do we actually crowdsource content, that is content for students, hints, explanations, scaffolding questions. I didn't show you that, but I might. YouTube videos or content from teach content to give to teachers, what we call instructional recommendations or new problems they might want to assign or the mapping of problems to skills. So I, my, 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 my worldview is actually shaped by this. So anyways, I, uh, I already mentioned if I had some superpower, it's actually grant writing. And so I have 19 funded projects right now. Um, there's a bunch of them in blue that is actually about, um, about actually just building up the crowd. Uh, and so we have a bunch of big efficacy trials that we're running. Um, but what I really believe in actually, and what I think is important is here in red is I have a bunch of things where we're actually just crowdsourcing different pieces of stuff from teachers. Almost all of our grants involve uh, getting some teachers involved. They are actually either writing explanations or actually answering kids' questions uh, and then giving kids feedback. And we're trying to machine learn actually um, from these things to figure out who to give what to. Um, so, uh, so instead of actually talking about those seven or odd grant actually names, uh, I just wanna say there's stuff that we give just in time support to students. That's the stuff that we spew right out immediately. But I think it's a really underestimated role, which is actually how do we support teachers uh, on content for giving problems or maybe even across problems. Uh, and I'll try to actually be more precise about that in a second. At the end of this talk, I'll talk a little bit about eTrials, which is another portion of my work where we actually use our platform to actually help other researchers do their own studies. Uh, so during the pandemic, actually, we had actually 6,000 actually teachers in March actually make an assessment account. We normally had them about 300 uh, a month normally would have actually um, been having. So obviously during the pandemic, we had all these teachers say, holy cow, we actually need something. So they actually flocked to us. Uh, this map is out of date because we've been busy doing other things, uh, but we have 300,000 users right now. Um, uh, I think actually what, something on the order of or certainly over 10,000 teachers uh, and 300,000 kids. Um, and I think actually our number of problems solved, I think is over 100 million. Um, and um, um, so what is assessments? Assessments is feedback. I guess I demonstrated that. Uh, it's also, but it really actually is focused on actually um, having a strong role for the teacher. I don't really believe in actually, um, in, um, in um, the sort of vision of like, oh, the computer's got artificial intelligence and it will actually do everything. Um, and um, teachers exist for a reason. 
uh, and my kid actually failed in online education, uh, even though he's taking a class uh, on Java uh, and his dad is actually down the hall. Uh, and uh, yep, yep, my boy failed Java uh, that I teach for a living actually. Uh, and why? Because during the pandemic, like we're like, oh, oh, you don't have to hand stuff in on time. And then he winds up procrastinating. And my boy probably never would have failed if he actually had to look a real teacher in the eye every day and realize you haven't done anything, Tom. What have you done in the last week? Um, so let me show you from the perspective of actually how assistance was used before we actually had a pandemic. Uh, I'm gonna play this video for you. Oh yeah, right. I'm... Take out your homework from last night. Here are the answers. Let me pause for a second. Everyone in America actually recognizes this sort of thing. Like if you were lucky, your teacher at least bothered telling you the answers, right, for problems you did last night. Um, but that to me drove my wife and I crazy. Like why do kids have to wait until actually tomorrow? Here's our experimental condition. Okay, so we're gonna go over your homework from last night if you wanna get out your sheets. Uh, a couple questions I noticed we did pretty poorly on. So she knows which question she wants to go over. look at is this one here. Three to the negative second times three to the negative eight. Common wrong answer was one over nine to the ten. What's wrong with one over nine to the ten? Pause one second. Um, 26 seconds into class, the teacher is actually talking about actually the most difficult question, okay, which was number the one that says 27% here, and my animations didn't actually show circling that. But actually, uh, teachers talking about common wrong answers that 56% of our kids got wrong, to me, is something really real and that our teachers actually like. So anyways, does the systems work? Um, we actually, let's be clear, most systems don't work. The US Department of Education has funded actually hundreds of thousands of, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars actually in, uh, in things. And most studies actually have shown actually either null results, uh, mostly null results. Uh, and so uh, IES is that institute that I was mentioning. This is, a, this is me hanging out with Jeremy Rochelle, the gentleman actually at SRI that did the independent evaluation of us here. We happen to be in the halls of Congress. Uh, and um, um, anyways, uh, if you go, it's a good book. And actually most things we actually don't know if they really work or not. Um, um, in America here, actually, well, before this pandemic, you couldn't sell a drug without actually proving that your, your stuff worked. But in America, you could sell any piece of educational stuff, actually, as long as you can get people to buy it. Um, uh, there is a, actually something um, called the Warwick Clearinghouse. I'll mention it in a second. But I just want to point out that actually the best meta-analysis by Sternberger, who and Cooper in 2013, um, uh, analyzed these intelligent tutoring systems actually um, and basically had this to say, which is the effect of these intelligent tutoring systems tends to be small and modest uh, and might actually also be contributing to the achievement gap. So that is, that is actually um, what we don't want is like stuff like this. So at West Point, actually, they actually did a nice study on actually the role of the flipped classroom. The flipped classroom idea um, was really popular a few years ago, and everyone was told, this is what you should go do. Uh, and a well-done randomized control trial at West Point actually showed that um, the flipped classroom on average was useful, meaning in the flipped classroom idea, and I don't really care to get into it uh, so much here, but actually the big idea was teacher records lesson, kids actually watch lesson, then come to class and actually do stuff. Uh, and um, turns out, on average, that was uh, effective, but it actually wor worsened achievement gaps, okay? We don't want interventions that actually make actually the kids that are struggling the most actually, um, um, like, do worse from that. Uh, it would be like actually releasing a drug in America and giving it to everyone, but all the African-American people actually get screwed by the, that. Right? And that works on average, but that's not good enough. We need to be able to take our educational technologies and test them with different populations and see, uh, do they at least not make achievement gaps worse, uh, if, if not actually at least improve them. Um, sadly, actually in the United States, and uh, you can get in the way we're figuring out without actually having demonstrated that actually you don't have disproportionate effects by different populations. Um, Anyway, I'll just throw up another paper that actually is on the positive side, which is, hey, an active learning randomized control trial actually helps narrow achievement gaps. Like these are the types of interventions we actually want. Um, anyways, um, 
Uh, I mentioned the what we're studying else already a few times actually in preparation, but if you don't know, actually most uh, in mathematics, there's very small number of interventions that have been reliably shown to actually be effective. Uh, I think there's uh, six at the time I made this slide uh, and um, we're, um, I'm about to tell you about a study where we're one of them. Um, anyways, um, this, this is a screenshot of actually these, see these laptops, these, I think they're Macintosh laptops, whatever they're called. ProBooks or whatever they are. Um, the governor of Maine, uh, his name was Angus King, he bought laptops for every seventh and eighth grader in his state. You know what he did that? Almost 20 years ago, okay? Uh, in 2002, Angus King bought laptops, Mac laptops for every seventh and eighth grader. In 2008, I realized this is a killer opportunity to run a randomized control trial because all the kids actually had the technology. All the teachers had the technology. Uh, they even actually gave out free internet, actually dial up actually at the time. Uh, I actually built my system to make it really easy to go offline. Um, anyways, it's a great place to do a randomized control trial. I recruited 44 schools, handed them over to actually SRI. SRI um, put them into pairs based upon their demographics and randomized them uh, into pairs. Uh, half the teachers actually had to use their existing methods for two years and then they could get learn then they could get trained on assessments and the other half got going right away um and uh and what were kids doing kids they were doing two things they were doing their textbook work uh and i didn't want to get sued by our textbook publishers so we didn't put the questions in but we actually put see this little slide on the bottom left hand corner kid would open up their thing and it would say open up your book to page 48 and go solve problem number 20. Uh, and uh, the kid does their work, does it on paper, types in the answer and gets feedback. I'll also note, see this slot where actually it says show answer for that textbook work. There were no fancy hint messages uh, uh, as I showed you. There was just correctness only feedback. Let's just be clear, correctness only feedback is super powerful. We have so many kids wasting so much time without getting feedback at all in America. Uh, and so I'm gonna tell you about actually our attempts to try to get slightly more intelligent feedback uh, but let's be clear, the single most important thing we need to do for every kid in America is get them immediate feedback in any shape, way, or form. Um, a Google Docs or a Google Form is better than nothing, actually, uh, or until waiting until tomorrow. Um, anyways, um, we also actually, a bunch of the teachers, I think 60% of them also gave out skill builders. These are these things I mentioned that actually you have to keep getting stuff right until you get three right in a row. This is the traditional sort of like repetitive math crap that you expect math programs to do. Uh, and uh, um, one thing that I think is really important to us is actually um, uh, teachers get these reports. Uh, they can see exceeded daily limits, see this little red thing. This is a kid, if they actually, they got to 10 problems, we cut them off and we say, go talk to your teacher, okay? We're not just gonna give you more hints because uh, on the 11th problem, what are the odds that you're gonna succeed? No, mo most educational systems don't wanna talk about actually the kids they fail. They just wanna actually talk about the average effects but actually we wrote a whole grant around actually the kids that actually wind up putting in lots of effort and still failing. Um, Cause my system, just like everybody else's system will actually fail kids. I uh, mean like they won't succeed actually. Uh, and so sometimes they need to really get teacher intervention to actually move forward. Um, it's really easy to build stuff and then actually blame kids when they fail. Uh, when actually we should actually as designers take responsibility for the platforms that we're building. Anyways, this is a picture of actually um, uh, Jeremy Rochelle talking at the White House about actually uh, this study that came out in 2016. And, um, um, and um, I encourage you to go read it. Um, the three main findings were teachers reliably changed their practices. They went over homework differently. Secondly, actually, we almost doubled student learning on average. But the most important thing is we started closing achievement gaps. We didn't come nearly close to closing them but we actually made it reliably better. Meaning kids that were below the median on their sixth grade math test actually learned essentially two years worth of actually learning. And we didn't do that by slowing down the high knowledge kids. The kids that were above the median on the prior year test, they still actually went up. It went up by 40%, um, but actually my wife and I built an intervention that actually helps, helps these kids. So how's the systems different than others? Uh, like compared to things like Carnegie Learning's Matthew or McGraw-Hill or Alex, um, like, like my advisors created actually Matthew uh, and, uh, and the idea is that if a kid learns something, we should let them go on, right? Like why should, we don't wanna hold them back. No, we should, okay? I'm here to tell you the counterintuitive sort of thing, which is no, you should have the gut instinct that no, no, 
we actually don't want actually kids moving on. Um, we want some amount of adaptation. What we actually, because because here's what happens with these when the computer is totally in charge. And I've gone into some of these classrooms um, where you go to the computer lab. Some kids are in chapter two, some kids are in chapter 23, and the teacher just taught chapter 11. The computer has nothing to do with what is going on in class. That is really wrong. That's not how we design platforms to actually help teachers do their job. That is the computer taking over. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think it's good. Uh, I think teachers, we need teacher pacing, not just self pacing. We want, we, we do want some adaptation. I mean, actually on tonight's homework, there should be a little bit of ad ad adaptivity. So some kids that need a little bit more help actually need to be able to be able to do some more problems. But actually we gotta, um, anyways, um, and I also just wanna say sometimes randomizing problems isn't good. I'm gonna show you an example here. Um, this is Ms. Razak, she's here in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, she's also getting a PhD with me. Um, and she, this is just a random shot from her class. You'll see that actually she sees, and if you look very closely on this image, you'll see 80% of her kids said one to this, this problem. Let me help you do the math. And you can see actually on that little image, she just saw 80% of her kids said one. Uh, and by the way, if you do the math out, they're doing order of operations wrong, right? They're actually, they're adding the four and four and three, uh, and then actually then doing the subtraction. That's the wrong order of operations. Uh, and so uh, many computer-based systems will randomize all the problems. A teacher can never do this, right? Actually, if every kid is doing every problem, it's different. And so I think it's really important. I actually, so I'm now gonna move into our, our crowd portion session of our talk. Um, four years ago, during this, um, during actually this big, huge study we had in Maine, uh, I met this guy, Crystal Siege, and my chief future trainer introduced me and said, Neil, you gotta meet this guy. Mr. Siege is really actually amazing. He actually used my system to write feedback messages for every question in his book. But I actually, it was some random proprietary book sold by Pearson or McGraw-Hill or something. The few other teachers that were in the state of Maine that were using that same book, they couldn't actually take advantage of his hit messages because uh, I hadn't thought that anyone would ever do that. Um, and uh, uh, But he was just basically, you know, he was mostly interested in just helping his own kids. So his kids got these extra hit messages, but I actually, uh, I hadn't done that. Um, so I instead went and actually wrote a grant around that. And so, um, so I'm gonna talk about actually just-in-time student support and particularly the hints and explanations is what I'm actually about to talk about. I'm about to talk to, about March Thanaporn, who is actually in this call right here, uh, his work on that. Um, I'm gonna talk about a few other things and I'm gonna to try to bring in my guest lecturer actually to talk about actually letting kids ask questions and to answer them. Uh, but let me actually talk a little bit about March's teacher assist work. So this is, I got to actually funding from the U.S. Department no, the um, Office of Naval Research, believe it or not. Uh, we don't train sailors, but our Department of Defense actually has got a crazy way of thinking about actually how do they actually procure actually training materials. And some of the program officers actually have the sense that we should be crowdsourcing, actually we should be building platforms so that actually the master sergeants that know how to actually, you know, fix aircraft carrier lifts or whatnot can put their information into a platform that is then owned by the Defense Department so they can stop paying outside providers to build actually stuff for them. So anyways, I actually, so March actually put, see this little blue link, I want to write a hint or explanation. Basically all we did is we put that on the screen and a teacher could actually click on that. They could actually then write a hint or an explanation. An explanation to us is actually where you just spew an explanation at them that will end with the answer and hints are step-by-step -step little things. I showed you, I wrote a hint of count on your fingers a few seconds ago uh, and that would be like a first level hint. We didn't tell them the answer in that. Anyways, we're, we're exploring both of these. Um, there's a cool blog that was done by the guy that actually did, was the teacher trainer. Uh, his name was Andrew Burnett. Um, and here actually he's using the open educational resource known as Open Up. Um, and um, he, um, he wrote this blog about actually how he's back in the classroom now and he uses assistance. Uh, and I just wanted to share with you the type of thing he does. And so this is exactly what it looks like for the student. So let's say the student looks at this problem and they're not really sure how to solve it. So they just enter an answer and they answer it incorrectly. It tells them that they're wrong because they've tried once and they're going to try again and they get it wrong and then they try it a third time and they answer it incorrectly. Take a look at what pops up. It's a video that I made using 
the whiteboard app explain everything. And then they just click on the video and the video will uh, run. So we have quadrilateral A here and I'm gonna make a little. And it will take them through the problem and it will show them how to solve the problem. And when they get all the way to the end, it will actually tell them what the answer is. Well, so the perimeter of the quadrilateral B. All right, pause. I'll tell you that actually Andrew Burnett, he says, hints suck, Neil. I actually write explanations. When my kids get it wrong, I give them this explanation, and then I actually give them another problem to do. Uh, and uh, that's, um, uh, we have yet to actually run a good randomized control trial showing actually hints versus explanations, and when is that good? But we're right now building out a product that actually uh, feature inside assistments to actually allow teachers to automatically assess and assign actually another, what we call a similar but not the same problem. Um, and so these hint messages sometimes, at least Andrew X kind of felt like, um, anyways, well, I'm leaving it up to as an empirical question. Um, and, uh, but I really believe that crowdsourcing is the future. Uh, the future of adaptive learning is, is the crowd holds the key. So anyways, March actually, um, March actually who's here. He built out this uh, experimental design. Uh, we call it the star teacher framework. Basically, my wife, the beautiful woman in the middle, actually picked nine teachers that she liked, that actually she thought would not embarrass us. Uh, and we basically paid them to actually spend an hour a night writing feedback for their own kids. I know that if I make a teacher write stuff that their own kids will see, they really curate their stuff. When they mess, mess up and make an error, they really care, right? Uh, these teachers are motivated to care about their kids, not about like, all these other kids. I hear about all these other kids because I really just want to extract their explanations and see if I can actually see if they'll work for others. The textbook publishers would like us to believe this is not a good way of doing things. They really believe in consistency. Oh, every problem should actually, we should use the same language. The explanation should always be, you know, really important. You can't actually just have this motley crew of nine random teachers using multiple different textbooks to actually making explanations willy nilly. Like what? Like, is is someone going to beat Encyclopedia Britannica actually with a crowdsourced actually motley crew of random actually people making encyclopedia entries? I thought yes. Uh, and uh, so anyways, the big answer is we ran a randomized control trial where we actually, um, uh, for all the problems where there's only one teacher assist, a teacher assist to us is either a hint or an explanation. Uh, if there's only one teacher assist, uh, there was some um, March actually would randomize it 90% of the time they would actually because I kind of thought this thing was going to be effective. So I didn't even do a 50 50 split randomized control trial. I did a 10 90. So most of the time actually um, Kids were randomized into getting a teacher assist if there was one, but 10% of the time they wouldn't so largely just so we could hold that out and see doesn't matter. We assess student learning on the next problems uh, and uh, uh, and so um, turns out uh, the main finding, go, please go read the paper. In fact, it just won best paper actually last week. Uh, and there's that actually amazing woman of, of my wife of mine that actually I already mentioned. Uh, and um, she stopped gardening. And um, um, anyways, she, she, she helped March actually get these teachers and organize all this for some crazy reason. Her name's not on the paper, even though she actually didn't have to work probably. Um, and um, you know the other thing we found? teachers wanted to do this. We found 146 teachers actually who started writing actually teacher assist for themselves. Now, by the way, from my perspective, that wasn't even part of the study, right? Like we picked these nine teachers and only these people we trusted. Um, but we had 29 teachers write over 50 actually assists and we had two teachers write over a thousand. On the right hand side, actually, March actually went up showing me, look, Neil, all these other random teachers started making stuff for their kids uh, and they didn't do it thinking actually we were going to take their stuff and give it to the world. Um, we're now going and we've actually, I had one of my subject matter experts go and figure out which of these teachers stuff do we actually want to actually release to the world. And about 80% of the stuff we kind of think that's good. We won't get embarrassed if actually those explanations are put into the mix. Uh, and because uh, what we really want to do is we want to really learn what are the types of explanations that are really important. Um, and so we're really inviting the research community to actually help us think about that. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, I'm writing an exploration grant to try to see what are, the, what are the features of these explanations. Some of these explanations were text, some of them were videos, some were actually, you know, by the way, gobs of teachers think they can do a better job than Sal Khan in writing, writing little video explanations. And I think they're 
probably right. Like there's probably more, there's 30,000 seventh grade math teachers. I'd say there's one guy named Sal Khan making videos at Khan Academy. That can't be the right actually solution. What we really want is we want to actually move on and actually be able to say, hey, what type of explanation should we give to what type of kid? And when I say that, we want a result like this um, for Zach and Heffernan in 2009, uh, to tutor or not to tutor, that is the question, um, where we actually had two different ways of giving feedback. One is, here's, here's the complete solution. That is, we will spew text at you and tell you actually something and you read it and you click, I have read this. And the tutor problem solving was actually, we will break the problem down into three steps uh, and uh, we'll give you hints on each step. Turns out what we found is lower knowledge kids, the kids that did actually below the median on the pretest, they really benefited from this step-by-step -step feedback. They learned more. The higher knowledge kids, actually, they actually benefited actually more from the solutions. Just give me the damn solution and let me read it. Um, this is what a personalization effect is, right? Actually, um, and um, we, in, we in America want to be able to detect these uh, uh, where we can kind of realize, oh, for this group of kids and particularly the lower performing actually students that need all this assistance and the types of schools that I used to teach in in Baltimore, uh, we need to design stuff that really works for them. Uh, and that's what we're after. Um, and so, but let's be clear, most of the 24 randomized control trials I've run, I think I've actually gotten maybe one, maybe two interesting personalization effects. So everyone thinks we can personalize really well, but actually the science of uh, really showing how to do that well and how to do that is by far actually not really there. Um, anyways, we right now are also trying to crowdsource actually explanations. And I'm going to give a shout out to my friend a Andrew Land here in a second, because I actually want to move, I want to move on. But we are crowdsourcing the explanations that we actually give to actually kids. Remember that actually that teacher that actually asked kids, hey, why did so many kids say one over nine to the 10th? And some girl actually said, I know, because they actually failed to actually, they multiplied instead of added the coefficients of the exponents or, or whatever that question was. Or I have walked around my class. Uh, if you're a seventh grade math teacher, you know kids always fail to multiply the coefficient of the second term every time they do the distribution rule. And I would just say, Oh, you failed to multiply the coefficient in the second row. Oh, hey, no, Max, it looks like you failed to multiply the coefficient in the second. Like, I, I knew this was going to happen, right? You can, you can predict it. Anyways, we should figure out, though, what's the right thing to say? Do you just tell them, actually, you failed to multiply the coefficient in the second rule? Or what's the right thing to do? We actually want to crowdsource those little explanations that will help a child not just know they got it wrong and why, but actually, like, why? Maybe, maybe the right thing to do is to show them the area model. Uh, and I don't have an example of that, but the area model is like why the distribution rule works. Um, and um, 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 I'm also actually running an experiment actually funded by NSF and Ethan Prior, my PhD student, who's the one that's going to release the COVID data set in a few weeks. And uh, he thought he was going to be able to be able to do it today at this talk. Um, but um, he right now is running actually our study where we're trying to figure out which YouTube videos actually we should give out. Uh, and so um, hold me to it. Actually, in a year from now, we should be able to tell you. <laughs> um, um, I will say that one of my PhD students, Corinne Ostro, actually, he, she actually, her first experiment she ran at assessments actually uh, was video versus text. She saw our hint messages for Pythagorean theorem, put herself on video, uh, and then wanted to figure out, do kids learn more if, if the exact same content is in video versus text? The general answer is yes, it is. Actually, seventh graders learn more with video. That's not always going to be the case. Uh, I think us, many of us PhD students, actually, or PhD people, probably like we're good readers. We actually can probably read faster than actually we can listen. Uh, and uh, but obviously, this is always going to work in kindergartners where they can't even read, right? Actually, so the question is not does video work better than text. It's like for what types of kids is that actually likely to be useful? So I want to pause here. I want to hand it over to Andrew. Andrew's, Andrew actually and I are super excited about the general notion of, of how do we actually help, how do we help actually let kids ask questions and crowdsource that. And so Andrew's student just gave a killer talk at the Educational Data Mining Society on his work. So Andrew, why don't you share your screen and, and um, he's a young uh, professor at UMass Amherst and we're working together on some projects, but I'm going to hand it over to you, Andrew. Uh, Andrew. All right, thanks, Neil. Yeah, so um, I think, um, so Neil was great, given all of this great talk about crowdsourcing, and I think what we have done so far 
um, can clearly have a lot of ties into it. So, um, so Neo has primarily been focusing on crowdsourcing from teachers. And I think, you know, our work recently can be sort of seen as crowdsourcing from students themselves. Yeah, there are a lot of works in this, uh, in this area, but I'm just going to give like a quick overview about um, what we're, uh, what we have done. All right. So um, let me see, can I go to the second? Okay, great. Yeah, so um, our main goal in this work is that since um, you know, there are a lot of ways. And Andrew, just to be clear, you're not in, you're not in full presentation mode. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of like the. Let me see. So can I? Okay, go to it's this? okay. If you want to just be in that mode, fine. Let's see. Um, uh, yeah. Hang on. Is this okay or? Oh uh, yeah, you got it in a funky. We're seeing you. Yeah, yeah. This is like a two-screen setup, so maybe I'll just stick to this. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, so um, so really, there are multiple ways of learning, and um, you know, learning through verbal interactions with teachers is really time-consuming, and it's good for students, especially during problem solving, and when they have um, you know, negative effect in particular. But um, the problem is the teacher really can't do this to every student at the same time simultaneously, which means that number one, the teachers are over burdened with a lot of um, they, they have a lot of burden and number two is um, students also they have they are stuck in this slow and insufficient feedback cycle right so what we do is one possible solution to this is to create virtual teaching assistants and these really just mean automated pedagogical agents that can really not I mean the way I think about it is we're not trying to replace anything we're not trying to replace teachers but to, uh, on quite on the, uh, on the other hand, on the contrary, we're trying to you know, help take away tasks that they can, that machines can do so that they can help, uh, they can focus and use more of their time on stuff that's actually important, that's actually de really dependent on humans and not, uh, and that's what we're hoping, which is to build a system that to support teachers rather than try to replace anybody. Yeah, and um, virtual teaching assistants, there has been a lot of so some recent success and um, especially this, this thing built by a group of people at Georgia Tech called Joe Watson. This is built on IBM's Watson system. And then um, essentially an AI that answers student questions in a discussion forum. And, but the thing is, it's still very basic. And um, we think that before it can become a reality, it needs, there needs to be a lot of development, significant advances in AI, so that it has, to sacrifice, uh, sorry, it has to satisfy three requirements. So number one is it has to be comprehensive, right? because it must decide whether to automatically answer a question or defer to the core staff, because for, for several different reasons. And the most, important, uh, the most obvious reason is just that some of these student questions are simply not answerable by a machine. You would have to expect that the human can answer it. And it would be smart for an AI algorithm to realize that this is a time that we should just ask uh, to defer it to the teachers. And then the second requirement is that it has to be aware of the context. Because not, even if a, T, a virtual TA can actually answer every possible question, I don't think you, you would want it to do that because having students to, to discuss among themselves and forming and finally arriving at the correct answer is actually good. There are a lot of um, people saying that that's very uh, beneficial to learning. So we'd have to make a decision on that. And um, so, and there are some works on analyzing the dynamics and discussion forums about how people interact with each other and including some of our prior work, which analyzes using discussion forum texts, uh, posts to discover um, the dynamics of uh, in posts, people's behavior, and also the interest of people, uh, different students in posting in different topics. And then the third uh, focus is conversational. It has to be conversational because it, it can't just spit out meaningful words. It has to engage in meaningful conversation with the student. And I'm not gonna talk about that because that's just, uh, that, that has been the focus in this research field for many years up till now. All right, so our contribution is essentially to um, look at automated, uh, automatic answering of frequent and repetitive logistical questions. In that arises in online discussion forums. Why do we focus on logistical questions? Because number one, these are very redundant and the information is there, either answered by somebody before or announced by the course instructor already. Um, 
and you know, it's usually it just it's a burden for TAs and instructors to answer them over and over again. This thing always comes up. Nobody really browses these things. I mean, if you're in class, you know that. Um, and our framework really has a couple of different parts. Uh, number one is you start by scanning through all the relevant course documents. And these documents include not only the lecture notes and all the, um, uh, the course textbook, but also they include logistical emails, these announcements that people send out, and also prior discussion forum texts, uh, posts, and, and satisfactory answers. So I think that links up nicely to Neil's point of crowdsourcing, because essentially now we're crowdsourcing previous correct answers and adding them into the repository of stuff that we can provide to students who ask this new question in the future. Yeah, and um, we're really um, using a sort of simple framework so it consists of two parts number one is you have you you separate all the course documents you separate them into chunks and then build a document pool for you to retrieve relevant documents that contain a possible answer to this particular question that's asked and then we use an automated question answering method to extract short and textual textual answers and in addition, we use an answerability classifier to, um, to sort of help us to decide whether this question is actually answerable and when it's not, hopefully potentially deferring to people, uh, humans. And what the data that we use is actually local, which uh, we collected in a UMass undergraduate physics class, introductory class. And it's a pretty large class with more than 2000 posts throughout the entire semester. So this is what we tested on. And you can see that we divided uh, these questions into different types. So about 20% are logistical questions, which are actually, you know, probably more than you think. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of conceptual questions, reasoning questions, and some of them are just not answerable. Um, and in this work, we focus in particular on logistical questions because most of these are factual. And because automated question answering methods so far can mostly only an, uh, answer um, factual questions. And um, what we did was we um, compared our system with um, several different baselines. So number one is those answers provided by core staff. We recruited core staff to rate all of these answers and see which one is satisfactory, which one is not, and which document is relevant to the student question and which one is not. We also compared with the IBM Watson system, and the result is, um, you know, we can outperform these other methods. You see, Watson is really inflexible in this case; it um, it it perform it's not really able to extract meaningful um, relevant documents and give and provide um, satisfactory answers. And um, we are not doing as well as humans, of course, um, but uh, sometimes we're a little bit more robust than, than humans, just because the uh, human TAs do not really answer every question that's out there. So we're definitely not better, but we have more coverage. And again, this is a visualization of what's going on. So you can see using an answerability classifier, you can sort of vary the threshold of whether you, which questions you choose to answer. And um, in terms of precision and recall, and we are just comparing against the humans and the IBM Watson system. So let me show you a couple of examples of what's going on. So, um, so for example, for this particular student questions that's been asked, what we do is we can extract a piece of um, relevant course documents. So this is essentially a, the lab syllabus. And then you can extract this and also extract a short text span um, for the answer. So these are just positive examples of you know, satisfactory answers. And you see that they're, they come from different sources. It can even be a course document provided by instructor, which is a lab syllabus, or for past the discussion forum post. That's this answer has been rated uh, as um, satisfactory. And um, we had to do some tweaking on our document retriever, but in the end it sort of worked out and can help us retrieve a healthy blend of both instructor provided things and student generated things. But there are also cases where this thing does not really work out. So you see in some cases you can you really extract irrelevant documents, but in some cases, you know, you re retrieve very relevant documents, but the short answer span that you sort of detect is just off. Right? These are things that we you know, will improve on. 
And also you can apply this to factual questions, but you know, there are, since this is a physics class, there are only a total of 18 questions all semester that are factual. And we can sort of do reasonably well, um, but these, the, in terms of coverage, that's just not very, not, not a lot. And I'm just gonna, just gonna skip this part. Um, uh, so yeah, I think there are a lot of cool works that, uh, that can come as a follow-up to this. And I think Neil and I are uh, exploring a lot of these interesting new directions. And specifically, um, some of the things that we are looking into are you know, um, see whether there are for these content-based questions that are more reasoning and stuff, instead of um, automatically answering that, if we know that that's not possible, can we at least extract relevant um, you know, course documents and to recommend to the students for remedial studies before they, you know, to help them to rethink about their question. And especially in the case when uh, these, the student question, you know, contains multiple modalities, including, for example, both text and math, if it's a mixture, how do you retrieve relevant course documents? That's an interesting topic. And also, uh, we want to be able to, uh, you know, not just use like large scale, um, uh, these NLP tools that are trained on large scale text data, but also adapt to student generated text. Because if you, if you have answered some student questions on discussion forum before, you probably realize that these 20 year old kids, uh, the way they talk are just, is just entirely different from what the, the way people write on Wikipedia. So um, um, you'd have to adapt to this data set for sure. And also, um, we want to do something with uh, misconceptions. I think that would be really awesome, although we're not sure uh, of the details yet. So before I hand back to Neil, um, I would like to just mention that um, we have another, we have a paper here on knowledge tracing, which is a, which is a classic topic in um, educational data mining and AI ed. And what we've done so far, what we've done in this paper is that to show that um, despite a lot of recent efforts on using deep learning to improve predictive accuracy, we actually showed that um, you know um, traditional models, things that are like IRT and other stuff that are based on inspired by cognitive theory, they still have a place in today's um, AI ed world because we showed that by combining these attention networks with um, IRT models, you can actually not only outperform um, deep learning based models, but also give you some excellent interpretability in your models. And um, that, that's it. And uh, thanks uh, to all the organizers and Neil. And um, yeah, we, um, so I'll hand it back to you. Neil, you're muted, it seems. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, the, um, uh, yeah, Andrew, your work actually is quite inspiring to me. Uh, and I appreciate all the interaction that's actually happening in the chat. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited to actually get to learn a little bit more about actually uh, my audience. I'm about to, I was about to actually tell you a little bit about some stuff we're doing uh, in some natural language processing uh, work. Um, but I guess in the interest of actually just making sure we're paying attention to our audience, um, I am get, I, I again, I'm going to actually stop screen sharing for a second and, and pause and let's have some audience participation and uh, question answering. So feel free to turn on your mic uh, and um, unmute yourself and ask whatever questions. Because um, if you have persisted this long, an hour and 10 minutes in, and there's seven, seven people here that I don't know who they are, uh, you have the opportunity to ask whatever question you want right now. The, um, all right. I'll give a tiny bit more wait time. Anyone want to ask a question? Uh, all right. I guess you, I get, there we go. Here we go. We got somebody. Look, we have audience participation. Feel free. Oh, yeah. Unmute yourself there. Anupam? Yeah, so, uh, Anupam Khan. Uh, I'm from India. Uh, nice hello. to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you too. 
so uh, you have uh, demonstrated the assessment uh, so does this assessment support the automated evaluation of subjective type answers I means uh, like yeah, I said, so like the, like it's more like open response right that is not computerized right yes 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 good so, i'm going to talk about that i'm going to uh, we we we've done a little bit of natural language processing fancy stuff that attempts to actually do that uh, uh, do you want to hear about that that work of ours? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, that means uh, answer is a paragraph, right? So uh, a paragraph has to be written. So how to evaluate that one? I say there is a ten marks uh, has been uh, ten marks is there. So I have to evaluate that out of ten. So how to evaluate that uh, that answer? Uh, excellent. Uh, and um, well, um, good. Actually, well, I'm actually prepared to answer that question. Uh, so uh, let me skip actually a few things and actually get to your question, which is, um, um, which is, um, so, so we had actually, we had, uh, so wait, I'm moving into actually supports for teachers, because here we're thinking about actually, I want to actually help an answer, I want to help a teacher answer open-ended questions, uh, where we try to actually grade it, but I don't trust our stuff yet. Uh, we want to do something like Google Smart Reply. Google Smart Reply is the, the thing at the bottom of this thing where you, Google's suggesting, how do you want to answer this email? Um, and we want to do that for teachers. We want to actually have, uh, and these are real kids without their real names, actually, and they're real answers here. And we actually want to actually suggest, uh, like this was a picture I made two and a half years ago. Uh, I wrote an NSF grant to actually do, we want to do natural language processing to help actually teachers uh, essentially not just grade, that is make the, the grading, but to make a comment that would actually be useful to them. Uh, and uh, uh, and um, um, we actually have, um, I think actually, we have, we have hundred, millions of open-ended response questions. The computer doesn't grade, it just actually puts, the teacher can go look at it. The teacher could grade it, but most of the time here in America, we don't, when you're doing your homework, you, your teacher's not grading actually everything you're doing. Uh, and so, but still, um, still anyways, lots of people have actually focused on grading. So here, I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done. So we have one paper that you could go take a look at where we basically, we, we collected, we paid a bunch of teachers to actually write comments back to their kids on their open-ended responses. Notice the theme here in my work. Uh, and then, we, but not just grade, to write a comment. And then we try to figure out, can we figure out which comment to give to which kids at which time? So, well, this paper basically kind of said, we can grade kind of okay. Um, um, what we can, um, turns out of the 18,000 comments that actually teachers wrote, 53% uh, of the time, they selected one of our options and edited it. And 34% of the time, they just gave out one of these. Well, here, let me show you what those look like. I should probably actually give it to you. These are the guys, these are the guys and gals that actually ran the study. Um, and uh, here, I'll show, I'll show you. Here, let me just give you concretely. Catherine Taylor, teacher in Kentucky, I talked to you two weeks ago. Uh, she's like, oh, here, uh, here. I'm like, Catherine, show, show your screen. And you don't mind if I use your face, right, Catherine? And she said, that's fine, Neil. Uh, so this is Catherine. Uh, she uses assistance. She loves this thing that I give away for free. And, and she was, Happy, I was like, Kat, Kat, tell me actually how my system sucks, because I'm sure there's lots of ways it sucks, right? And she's like, no, 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 Neil, you're pretty good. Actually, when you say a four, actually one of these options is pretty good. And when you say a zero, actually you're not too bad. You, you guys don't do very well uh, uh, in the middle. Uh, and uh, that is actually, um, which is like this version. Um, the, the top kid, actually Sachi, she actually basically, in solving the system of simultaneous linear equations, she correctly identifies 100 as the break-even point, and Ganji is the kid that does a really crappy job and basically says mountain charter is better than snowboard. Uh, and Wei actually, she she or I don't even know if Wei is supposed to be a male or female name. Uh, she said she because uh, I made up the names. Uh, there's actually real kids that wrote these things, but this kid actually says 72. Well, she correctly identified mountain charter is better when there's 72 kids in the thing. We wanted to write some comments, which is like, hey, is it true for all instances? Or try try 115, do you get the same thing? Because if the break-even point is at 100, like this student, 
uh, correctly identified one of the things, but didn't actually identify actually the break-even point. Um, so anyways, you can kind of tell in our data here, which is actually kids actually would actually just take, teachers actually liked our, they basically liked our triaging when they, they were kind of, if, because uh, our grading wasn't all that bad, but they were much less likely to use one of our comments if the kid's score was somewhere between zero and four. Uh, and so, so there's plenty of work for us to do. Um, super important because this is data during COVID. Do you see this row 18 and 19 that I have highlighted here? Uh, or, well, I have, I have row 17 highlighted, but actually you see that number in, in row 19? 117,000 times a teacher during COVID times wrote a comment to a kid using my system, okay? Like this Catherine Taylor. We, do, we see during COVID time, and notice that's a huge spike. Um, and um, teachers feel they need to send messages to their kids, like during COVID times, right? Actually, and it's not too surprisingly, because if you're a real teacher, you know you actually need to somehow stay con connected. So it seems like Catherine Taylor uh, was very excited. Um, she also is one of our teacher trainers, and she's like, Neil, I think actually uh, the average teacher will be more likely to give a comment just because you give them a starter. And I hadn't really thought about that. And she's like, um, uh, and she's like, when I train other teachers, I didn't realize she actually is someone that actually we've hired to train some other teachers. Uh, but so this encourages teachers to give the open-ended questions that we want them to do anyways, right? Uh, uh, I haven't documented that that's actually true either. Um, uh, but there's a really good researcher named uh, Jaeger who actually has been showing uh, the wise interventions. Wise interventions are a bunch of African-American boys. You're much more likely to get them to pay attention to the feedback on their essay, uh, like you double their actually consumption of their feedback if you actually start it with, hey, I'm giving you this negative feedback because I have high expectations and you can succeed. Uh, and I'm like, ooh, I'm dying to actually run that study where we take the teacher's comment and we just slap on, and they didn't write it, but we slap on that, that little thing and see, do we get the effect we actually want? Uh, and so we're trying to run that randomized control trial. We haven't done that yet. Um, here's a different teacher, Natalie Nickel. Uh, kids can also upload uh, their open-ended, they, they can upload images. In this case, actually, this first row, Natalie's saying, good, but label your axes. So our X and Y axes aren't labeled. And um, she's like, Neil, could you give us a button so I can demand the child to respond? And I was like, that's a good idea, Natalie. Uh, and that way we can turn this more into a dialogue. Uh, um, um, in this case, by the way, oh, she also falsely thought, actually, we know how to read these images. She's like, I can't believe how good you're at it, these images. And I'm like, we don't actually do any image processing. Uh, and so um, um, anyways, you, you can tell the examples I'm giving here of like show your work or how do you know or get started are not actually good things that we actually should be saying to them. So anyways, I'm giving you some negative examples of actually uh, where we're not succeeding well. Um, I will say just actually on the net, on the um, uh, uh, voice processing, one project we actually did is actually one of my PhD students, Shawen Liu, third author on this paper. She's uh, she teaches Chinese kids. No, she teaches American kids at Brandeis Chinese, uh, and so she actually has all these audio files lying around where she is actually graded kids. Now, by the way, actually, uh, if you don't know how to say one, two, three in Chinese, it's actually e or some. Uh, and so if you're asking actually the kid, the American kid, you know, count to three actually in, in Chinese, they should say something like that. I'm sure my tone isn't very good. Anyways, but we used actually what's called a like, Siamese network to try to do a better job of this. Uh, and I'm excited to actually consume uh, uh, T TALs actually papers on this topic because they're probably much more sophisticated than the silly things we've started doing. But I really am a firm believer that we need to let kids actually use their own voices uh, and maybe actually for assistance to do some really cheap actually auto translation so kids, teachers can pay attention to what their kids are saying and, um, and my job as a platform provider is to figure out how to actually help how to help actually teachers fool their kids into thinking they can pay attention to more than they actually can pay attention to because no teacher can pay attention to everything. Uh, we need to help them, help them connect and feel like that kid feels like, hey, you know, Mr. Heffernan is paying attention to me. Um, um, so anyways, we actually, um, um, I, 
one thing that I think I'd actually want to share before I actually uh, I yield the floor is one funny thing we've done. Well, funny, it's not funny. Um, it's actually really cool. This guy named Ryan Baker, he actually um, used machine learning to go into classrooms using assessments and actually build up detectors of frustration, boredom, confusion, and engagement. So basically, 3,000 times, essentially, Ryan actually looked at some kid for 20 seconds and said whether they're frustrated, bored, confused, or engaged. Then we actually machine learn actually a detector of frustration, boredom, confusion, and engagement uh, and put that into assessments. Uh, so we can kind of tell um, uh, much better than chance, actually, who ki which kids look frustrated, bored, and confused, uh, frustrated, bored, confused, or engaged. Um, and, um, um, and so we are excited about their work. In fact, what we want to do is we want to apply that work. Uh, and Anthony Vitello, my PhD student, is trying to apply that work to kind of actually look at actually giving teachers suggested messages not about their kids' open responses, but maybe uh, the kid that I'll just call Gaming Ganji, uh, who actually has been tagged as a gamer, what's the message you actually, a teacher wants to send? Like, it seems like you're going too fast, please slow down. Um, maybe it could be a more policing message of like, you're gaming the system, I'm gonna fail you. I'm, I'm assuming that's probably not the most effective way for a teacher to actually get kids to actually take things seriously. It's probably better to actually imagine a sort of, um, a different sort of tone uh, and um, like um, uh, and so particularly actually how do we get kids to be paying attention in these COVID times because uh, I think lots of kids are going to start to drop off how do we actually help teachers get their kids to know hey my teacher is still paying attention to me and it probably is not like you stop doing anything and actually uh, what's wrong with you it probably should be like is your family well? Actually, I see you haven't done your homework. Uh, maybe that's a better tone. Anyways, it's an empirical question. We should actually try to figure that out. Um, anyways, by using things like our, say our boredom, frustration, engagement sort of detectors, we clearly want to be able to help kids like I'll call learning Lati or Lalit uh, actually, hey, you, you know, you started actually struggling at the beginning, but your persistence paid off. Good job. I feel like that's super important in these COVID times to actually help kids, particularly the kids that you actually say, hey, you haven't been doing stuff, but then to say, hey, look, your, your work, it worked for you. The, the fact that you did something, so keep it up. Um, anyways, I actually, I think I wanna actually go back to more questions. Uh, I really, but I guess my, my big question is, I'm a real big believer in crowdsourcing, um, including even crowdsourcing new problems. Um, um, in this talk, I did a very bad job of talking about other people's work. I am not the first guy that to think about crowdsourcing. Jim Stigler at UCLA has this really cool thing called Corscata you could look at. And, oh, I have a few other slides, uh, a few other references I want to point out of people that really do crowdsourcing work uh, well that I respect. But before I do, I just want to say the, the last bit of what we do. We run something called e-trial. So you, if you're a researcher and you want to run a randomized control trial on our 300,000 kids, you can propose a study. Uh, it will go to Dr. Ostro uh, and she's actually running this. Uh, and uh, we, this all started because like, I first built assistance to run my own studies. I've published 14 randomized control trials. Um, they're here. Uh, you know, we looked at work examples for step-by-step -step scaffolding. We looked at actually, oh, whether you should give kids, force kids to get hints uh, or, uh, or, or, or force them to hit a button asking for him when they feel like it. By the way, the answer is you should not force hints upon them. You should actually let them ask for them. Uh, that causes more learning. Uh, we looked at choice of medium. That is actually, I already told you Corinne Ostro actually was comparing video versus text. She also then went on to go, well, what if we actually give them choices of that video versus text versus we randomize them to video versus text? Turns out choice is really important. Actually, uh, you should go read that paper. Um, I already gave you this one about to tutor or not to tutor that have this uh, personalization effect. But after doing a lot of these studies myself, I realized we should open this up. And I started doing other studies with other researchers. Uh, there's eight of them that I know of. Well. I, of course, know of the ones I wrote. Uh, there's eight, eight of them, actually, like Sydney DeMello at Notre Dame, now at the University of Colorado Boulder. We looked at actually comparing teacher-created videos that are just 60 seconds long and how that impacted whether they finished their homework or not. Uh, and, uh, um, and so I get excited about this sort of stuff. 
Um, so if you want to run a study, you can actually go build your own study inside assistments. You can watch a bunch of videos made by my wife that will teach you how to build your own study. And, and, uh, and if she approves it and Corinne approves it, then we'll run it for you. Uh, and um, I have a good audience here. Uh, I, I, I like that young lady. Uh, and uh, uh, so let's go do experiments. Experiments are important because we need to figure out what works in education. Uh, and uh, um, what I'm really excited about is I got funded uh, most recently by the Schmidt Foundation to actually build out a platform to let external researchers run their own studies. Uh, so if you want to actually run a study, you can actually come learn how to do that here. I'm super proud. Here's nine studies that have been written by other people. You will notice my name is not on them. Emily Fife was the first person to do one. She, of course, says nice things in her paper about using a systems platform, but she had a hypothesis that seemed reasonable at the time about actually, she actually really believed that high knowledge kids shouldn't be given feedback. You should delay feedback for them. Um, that's not what she, turns out she didn't find that. Um, I'm a huge believer in immediate feedback, so I kind of was like, I should be open-minded enough to actually recognize if this researcher has done some small scale studies in laboratories to show we should not give kids, high knowledge kids, we shouldn't give feedback and we, we should give it delayed. I kind of thought, well, that could be really important. But um, I have yet to actually see, other than golf swings, apparently actually um, perceptual motor actually skills, you shouldn't actually give feedback right away. You should get them to swing the golf club a bunch of times before actually giving feedback. Uh, but it seems like in mathematics, I have yet to see really good examples where we shouldn't give immediate feedback. Um, so if you want to run a study, you actually have to comply with our IRB terms of use. All of your data will become publicly available actually uh, eventually. Um, and probably the killer thing that I'm super excited about is, is then helping researchers combine KDD methods with taking action. So we have actually released actually a data set of 22 experiments where we actually are comparing like hints versus this and blah, 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 all these different things. Can, can, can people use their cool methods uh, to actually figure out how to actually reduce confidence intervals of X treatment effects? We want to learn what works. Uh, so this paper is the first paper I'm aware of that has combined cool machine learning. In this case, we use deep learning on data before any of the studies begin to actually build a better model that will predict which kids will finish their homework. Then we actually then we actually made a bunch of experiments and then actually uh, we basically showed that if you just use the data from the experiments, you don't do as well as, as if you actually used our prior data to first build this machine learned model that will make predictions. Uh, and uh, um, anyways, I'm super excited about that stuff. I think I want to stop and, and actually say, all right, there were some slides I wanted to say about giving actually credit to a bunch of other people that do crowdsourcing. Uh, there's uh, like obviously Stack Overflow and Reddit, but Teachers Paying Teachers is actually a sort of thing. Um, there's a bunch of people that have actually done work that I respect enormously. Paul Denny, Hassan Koveri, and actually Samir Bhatnanar actually have various crowdsourcing ways of getting stuff from kids. I didn't even talk to you about kids. Um, the previously mentioned actually Jake Whitehill actually um, um, that was mentioned about the GLAD system where he, he does crowdsourcing. He's, he and I, well, his office is right next to mine and we work together on a bunch of actually projects. Um, and, um, um, and I really wanna give a bunch of, a big shout out to Yuhu Kim who's in Korea and he does really killer work too on this crowdsourcing. So I think the crowds, I think anyways, crowdsourcing I think is really important. And in these pandemic times, we need to build technologies that can actually allow teachers that are doing some actually um, online tutoring. Um, by the way, um, the United Kingdom is gonna spend a billion dollars on actually one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Uh, Netherlands has announced they're gonna drop $250 million on one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Tennessee has committed already a million dollars to actually a thousand people to do uh, tutoring where they're going to hire recent graduates that can't get real jobs actually and put them to work tutoring. I think it's going to be a huge waste because we're going to actually have thousands of like tiny little Zoom recorded sessions where we're actually a human is trying to teach some other kid. How do we actually, how do we crowdsource small bits of tutoring, like little explanations and motivational messages and then apply them 
on others. And so that's the sort of thing I want to do with my life and that the types of tools we're building. And so I want to combine a tool that actually helps allows teachers to actually help their kids while actually helping others. Okay. Okay, the conclusions and the future outlook. So as so we have to have a, 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 a series of presentation talking about how to apply AI in education. So I believe that, uh, personally, I believe that the potential for AI is uh, in the teaching and development of knowledge cannot be underestimated. So actually, we already have, we already see a lot of kind of AI-driven, AI-driven product in the market, actually. Uh, uh, however, it is useful in education in terms of separate out how AI can help learners and teachers. So that so that's why at least just at least a few a few kind of points to summarize how AI can help learners. For example, personalized learning we already have discussed uh, uh, quite a bit, and also individualized feedback. You already mentioned <coughs> a few kind of a few things about that, <coughs> and also the repetitions <coughs> and the practice supporting collaborations. How AI kind of help kind of our how AI system can be used to monitor some of some of the collaborations and you kind of kind of manage the kind of how, how do we use AI to encourage and manage those kind of collaboration working environment. And also AI, AI can help a lot on teacher side. So <clears throat> I believe the AI system will kind of will change the nature of what is taught by the teachers, and also <clears throat> the AI system can help teachers to assess and monitor student progress. As Neil also mentioned, the assessment system also did a part of that. Okay, <clears throat> and to summarize, I believe the development and the application of AI bring the rapid change to almost every aspect of the life, also include the educations. And uh, we hope more people from different communities, especially for the KDD community, will you know, pay more attention to the education field and the people will be more open to all the data mining research on education. Yeah, that, here I just leave a few references about all the work so we will put the we will put all the slides and the videos on the website. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, um, we'll stand here at the podium for a little bit. We'll pretend like this is a real conference, so you can.